Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TetraCast. This is RPG Sites' weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. I am the one that hosts this group of people. My name is Brian Vitale because someone has to speak first. Joining me today, I've got George Foster. Hi, everyone. I've got Adam Vitale. Hello. And James Galizio. For Final Fantasy XIV discussion. We do not have Josh here today. He said he had a sore throat and didn't want to speak for uh, two to three hours or however long we end up teamingly to go on this thing. Uh, but yeah, James kind of, you know, just put it out there. We're probably going to be talking a lot about Final Fantasy XIV because we had several hours worth of news and footage from yesterday, both about the new expansion as well as what's coming up next in the 5.5 update. Uh, I can't speak to that and we'll get to that when we get to it. So first, we're just going to talk about what we normally talk about to start these things out, and that is games we have been playing. I'm looking at the list here, and I'm looking at something that George has been playing that no. <laughs> I am eager to hear about. Uh, a game that, an RPG that released just in the last week or so, Werewolf, the Apocalypse, Earth, Blood. Did I get that vomit of words in the right order? Yes, um, you did. Tell me about this werewolf game. Oh, jeez. Where to begin? Uh, it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. We were right. <laughs> it, it's it's bad in ways I didn't expect it to be bad, and it's good in ways I didn't expect it to be good. But overall, it's bad. It, it's not... I wouldn't recommend it. Um, straight off the bat, I have to admit, I don't know anything about the world of darkness. Um, I don't know anything about Werewolf the Apocalypse. I have now done some research. <laughs> I have looked into it a little bit. I know the basics, and it's actually kind of interesting. Like, not not amazing or anything like that. I, I personally don't get it like some people might, but like I can see why some people are interested. So what, what, the game, what, what George is alluding to there is that, uh, for those that don't know, Werewolf the Apocalypse is in the same, like, universe or set of set of books set of game uh, tabletop games as vampire the masquerade and a bunch of other ones that i can't remember off the top of my head you know x the y uh adam what's another one uh like hunter the reckoning or something like uh, that yeah that's one. Up. that one but, sounds familiar yeah. as well Richie. so uh obviously when we talk about these games the one that comes to most people's mind is vampire the masquerade bloodlines which was kind of a cult classic, but objectively not a great game. Uh, and then, of course, it's had its own drama with the sequel kind of getting like delayed several times and having a bunch of studio drama. And now we've got a werewolf game that's been out and published and available to be uh, attempted to be enjoyed. So not <laughs> they, ha they haven't exactly uh, hit it out of the park yet with, with their IPs. But that's, that's the thing. Like I, I've heard stuff about vampire the masquerade um, i think adam's talked about it like fairly recently and it seems to be really well liked uh and the reception to werewolf this werewolf game has been like oddly mixed when i started playing i was like oh, i can't wait to have one dunk on this and then i see reviews are like yeah it's pretty good i'm like what game are you playing <laughs> i think i'm playing a different game because it's just i i know it's object like reviews are objective well it's subjective but i, I just don't see I just don't see it. I, I've I've read I've read the positive reviews. I agree with some of it, uh, which I'll get to later. But overall, I just I just don't think this is for anyone. I can't recommend this to anyone. Um, yeah, so we we were we were talking about it in our in the podcast last week. How we were like we were just having a hard time mustering up enthusiasm for this game, and so to me, like the pre-release stuff, this is sort of hard for me to like nail down exactly why. But it almost looked like not necessarily the visuals, but it, it almost felt like from what I could tell, a PS3, Xbox 360 era, mm. like kind of action RPG in terms of, I don't like, again, it's hard, hard for me to explain why I feel like that, but I don't know. Just... No, that's exactly what it is. That is it, like, that is spot on. The word for it I used last week was it looks janky. Guess what? It's janky. Very janky. Uh, and that, that's a, I love that word. It's kind of hard to nail down exactly like what that means. But I think, I think from hearing that you kind of picture like it's a bit buggy, doesn't feel right. It doesn't really nail any of its concepts. Uh, it can be fun sometimes, um, which I, I will get to. So start off, like I say, I know nothing about this universe. Uh, I know a bit more now and I am oddly a little bit more interested, but not because of the game, because of my own research that I did to like go alongside my review, just so I didn't sound like an idiot. Um, 
he plays Cajal, and he is a, I don't know how you pronounce G A U R O. That basically he's a werewolf. Um, Garo. And, yeah, Garo, and he is like the leader of the tribe, or one of like the the heads of the tribe. Um, and basically, a mission goes very wrong, and he gives into his rage. He accidentally kills another one of his members. This is within the first half an hour. So it's massive spoilers. Uh, so he runs away for five years, comes back. Nothing's changed with him. Like that is such such an interesting idea that the game never capitalizes on is like giving into your rage, like having to control yourself so you don't turn into this monster. Like I'd love it. Oh, there's so much about this damn game. <laughs> they miss so much, but it never comes into play again. He has this breakdown at the start. He has this moment of weakness. He goes away and suddenly he's back. He's the exact same person. People are a little bit angry at him. They're like, oh, you dick, why'd you leave? Okay, here's the, the plan. The time skip uh, ends up just like not mattering. No, I didn't even realize. Like, I, I was, I, I will admit, and I'll, I'll say it's my review. I just could not care less about this game by the end. Uh, I went in with no expectations, but it just somehow it just drained the life out of me. So when I was, I wasn't paying super like too much attention, but I, I didn't notice there was a time skip for a little bit. I was like, oh god, yeah, like time has passed. He left for a reason. Like it wasn't just like a cutscene. Uh, he's been gone. Um, and from there, as soon as you come back, there's minimal interest in the plot. There is so little that's interesting about it. It's just so... For a world that isn't generic, like like I say, read up on the lore, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's weird. They're like eco-warrior werewolves. It's like That's an awesome sentence, but the game never <laughs> capitalized. Uh, so isn't the premise of this game, based on what the marketing and trailer show, and like, there's some like oil company that is threatening his... like forest home yeah so like that it's as generic as that uh the oil company is like being secretly run by the the worm which is the opposite of gaia which gaia is like the force of life uh so there's like th there is there is stuff to do with the lore in here there is enough that i feel like if you're a fan of the world of darkness you might actually get a kick out of it because i had to i had to look up some terms and phrases uh it doesn't do a good job for newcomers but then i, I won't hold it against that because it is for fans, like you can tell, it's for people who care about the world. Um, so this is um, this is Fern <laughs> Gully with werewolves. It, it's just, <laughs> it never does anything with it. It just, it just plods along. You just, you do the same thing over and over again. None of the characters change and develop. Nothing majorly dramatic happens. You can see it coming a mile away. Uh, and I feel like you could forgive the game for being somewhat repetitive and boring if you cared about the characters and the story and the world. And just in my case, I just really didn't. He's Kahal's a sucky protagonist. He's so like generic. Uh, it's it's it, 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 I just keep thinking about it, and I, I can barely remember a thing about him. I know that he has a daughter, and his daughter doesn't like him because he ran away. And <laughs> the most interesting parts of the game are their relationship. Dad ran away from home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's exactly that. And that scene, I, I swear to God, that scene lasts about five minutes. They 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 meet again. It's like God, I hate you, Dad. You left. And then he's like, I'm proud of you. And she's like, okay then. I'm like, it's, what? It just, there's nothing, there's no investment here. It never pays off. I didn't end the game going, yeah, like I'd love to see what happens next. I don't care. I don't think anyone cared. Did um, you, so you did manage to finish. Have you finished? Yeah, cool. Well, th this is another point. The game is incredibly short. Like, I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if I did something wrong, but I, I got like 96% completion in about seven or eight hours. And, oh, that's way shorter than I expected. I was thinking like yeah. 15 to 20, maybe that would be, you know, shortish. And I think RPG. I know why though. Like, cause I, again, I've, I've read some reviews that said it's about 20 hours. I've read reviews that say it's about 15. And I say, uh, that's definitely not what I've just played. Unless there's like a, a secret option in the menu to play like the second half of the campaign. No. But the reason for that is if you choose to do the stealthy approach, which I would not recommend because it's not good stealth, it is the most generic, boring stealth. If you choose to go that way, each encounter will be so <laughs> much longer. If you choose to go in there and go, okay, I'm werewolfing up the fun part of the game, I'm going to do it. Okay, we'll do that. Each encounter, two minutes. If you do it in stealth, it can be 10 minutes long. So I imagine people getting like a lot longer playtimes because of that. There's no side content. There's no, there's no, extra missions there's nothing else you can do in the game you just follow along you get given one side mission at the start of the game um by gaia or whatever and it's like 
interact with the dead spirits to gain gain some skill points, and you do that. And to my knowledge, to my recollection, that's the only side mission in the game. And there's like a there's a hub world as well. Like there is a semi hub world. You can go into this like you go into like your den area and you can like interact with a few people. But like there's no point to it because every time you leave that place, you're like basically right next to the next mission. And then you go into the the Endron camp office place and you go in there and you sneak in. You do the same thing over and over. There is one scene in the game which is different, and you go into this prison, and it's like it's slower, but it's at least it's something different, you know. Like it, it tries something, and then you can just ignore that if you want to. You can just turn into a werewolf and mess it up. And oh god, the thing that <laughs> the thing that's most disappointing is that it's not like this IP is cursed to be bad because actually last year there was the um, visual novel style game Heart of the Forest, which didn't you know light the world on fire, but people had a generally positive reception to it, including uh, Danny here at RPG site. But even like the Steam reviews are uh, pretty positive on this. Mm. It's just that when they try to say like, okay, what, what fits for a werewolf game? And apparently they uh, landed on an action stealth hybrid. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that's where I would have uh, ended up. Well, <laughs> this is the thing. I, I truly believe that there is enough lore here. There's <clears throat> interesting elements to this world, as I'm sure there is in Vampire the Masquerade as well. I truly believe that they could do an interesting story. I just, I just don't think they've they've done it here. It's it's generic. It's the sort of game I would have picked up from Blockbuster on the PS3 and, and played. It was a five hour game, not good. It, I'm surprised you're uh, yeah. old enough to make that. Uh... <laughs> I don't think Blockbuster was even really around for most of the PS3's life. I can, I can remember I can remember picking up Binary Domain, which is a good game. That was a blockbuster game I picked up, but that that's not the comparison. Anyway, Werewolf, uh, so uh, gameplay... Earth Flood, as good as Binary Domain. <laughs> no, the Interstate will hate me. People like that one. Um, so gameplay, right? So you, this is where it fails for me completely. I just don't uh, understand who thought that a werewolf game needed to be stealthy because I've never even ever consider werewolves to be a stealthy like monster type well this is what's interesting what what is what could have been interesting is that you actually have three different forms so the stealthy form is your human form and your wolf form and then the combat form is like the werewolf form uh and every time you okay, go into on, the, on paper, the, the idea of, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but on paper, I didn't think about that. Um, the idea of having, first of all, I don't know if like a human form should do much other than walk and talk, but uh, I like the idea, I, I, okay. I like the idea of having like a four legged, you know, wolf form that acts slightly differently. So to did the, I, but they don't do it well. It's so <laughs> bad. Right. Okay. Here we go. I'm, I'm angry now. I've, I'm werewolfing up. This is it. So, <laughs> sucks it all you're almost always forced to crouch walk <clears throat> you have to sprint you have to hold down the button to have any sort of pace so you're always crouch walking it's really annoying the human form is the one that can interact with like cameras and doors and stuff like that so you are constantly changing from the wolf form which is faster back into the human form so you can do stealth takedowns and you can open a door but it's like why doesn't the wolf have a stealth takedown i just want to play as the wolf the wolf is the fastest it is the best way to move around but like when you're in these Endron offices, for some reason, and I, I cannot figure out why, I've checked the controls, see if I'm holding a button wrong, but you are always slowed down to a crawl in these Endron offices. So even when you're a wolf, you are always slinking. You have to keep pressing the dodge button to like make any distance. It just sucks. It doesn't feel good. And this wolf, he, he is fun to control usually. When you're outside the Endron offices, you can run around. Sort of remind me of the when we were riding Palamets on Monster Hunter Rise. Like it, that, that's simple enough fun. They just don't do anything with a wolf. It's pointless. Like you either human and wolf, they're both for stealth. But like the human form always does the takedowns. The wolf is just a like it's basically a crouch. It, yeah, it is literally just a crouch because you use it to get into vents, and it's such a waste because you could even if they just added the option to have stealth takedowns as the wolf, it would be fine. Like that would solve the problem because then it would have a purpose. It just doesn't have one. Oh God! See, um, do you see how wound up this game is making me? <laughs> what I, I'm second guessing starting with this. I'm if 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 the listeners make it through this section. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> well, I sometimes made a sometimes it's interesting. It's like actually interesting to talk about like games and how they falter. I mean, 
well, in, in, a, in a measured way, I guess. Yeah. Like also, what I'll say is that it doesn't feel like it's very often that we have uh, George like really down on a game. So yeah, to hear totally. him have a game that he's just like, "What the hell happened?" It's like an interesting change of pace. Yeah, like I'm I'm usually the hype man. I'm usually like, yeah, Gotham Knights looks sick. There we go. I mentioned <laughs> it. But this is the first time I can think of besides Avengers, which was a mixed bag. I still liked Avengers, but it was a mixed bag. This is the first time I've played a game and gone, I don't recommend this. Well, not ever, but on this podcast, I've gone, yeah, I don't like it. Uh, the only element of it that is that I would argue is good and genuinely quite good. The reason why I'm probably going to give it probably a five because the combat, when you are playing as a werewolf, <laughs> it's fun. It's simple fun. You, you're like this massive hulking beast. Every time you dodge, you're like smacking in something, bits of the environment are flying, blood's going everywhere. Uh, and it's it's really simplistic. Like it is the most simplistic button mashy uh, brawler I can think of in recent memory. But it's fun. It is simple fun. And when you when you're stuck otherwise just walking around slowly taking down people and getting spotted from a mile away because I don't know it does the stealth doesn't work very well. And then you're just like, oh screw this, I'll just kill everyone. Like that's fun. But I feel like. The game introduces the concept, like I said earlier, it introduces the concept that, that this isn't something you want to do, that this is a punishment, that every time you fail stealth, you go into that mode as if, like, oh, you idiot, you're the werewolf now. Like, they should have done something with that. Give me give me a bad ending for that. Give me, give me a consequence. Give me less health. Give me anything that makes me not want to just do that and pace through the game. I, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, and that's it. That's the whole <coughs> game. The whole game is poor stealth, misused wolf bad characters looks like a ps3 game good combat and that's it and out of out of all the shortcomings that you just listed the the one that i think is the most interesting is how it has like this one side mission and this hub area that's never used it makes me wonder if they had like what was the actual ambition for this game and then they realized at some point that they didn't have the chops for it or the budget for it or the time for it or the inspiration for it or like what was it because it just seems like they had like this framework set up where they could have done more and they just didn't. This is what's weird. So when when I'm writing a review, I like to try and get as much information about a game as possible outside of playing it. So I'd like to try and know as much as I can about the game, know the scope, know what, what was the intention. And they actually mentioned before release, uh, it's probably on our site somewhere, that there's a rage management system. There was going to be a rage management system where sometimes you couldn't control the werewolf inside. Like you would just burst out and it would like mess things up. And that sounds awesome. That is exactly what I would like. Like I'd love to to have not been doing the stealth. I couldn't be bothered. And then I sneak I I do the stealth and then this one time something goes wrong and I just explode and I'm a werewolf and it's just that would have been cool. That would have been a consequence. But I guess it just it just never came in. Like I I've never seen it. There are these weird little interactions where sometimes you have to talk to a person and like you have to not press r1 to get annoyed and turn into a werewolf but it's like okay i just won't press r1 or in my case i just pressed r1 for the fun of it so <laughs> it's just a bizarre game um again I, ha I have to say like if if you like the lore then maybe that's enough for you i'm sure if i played a, a pretty poor kingdom hearts brawler but it was kingdom hearts i'd, I'd probably enjoy that but as someone who doesn't know anything about it, it's just bad. Just a just a bad game. So I was looking into so this game was developed by Cyanide Studio, which is a French company, and they don't they're mostly known for like pro cycling games. The pro cycling what? manager <laughs> uh, Tour de France. They're a French company again. You're probably they getting to this, made... but go ahead. I think you're getting right to what I'm thinking. Well, they've also there's a couple of games more recently that I have heard of, like Call of Cthulhu, which yep, that's what I was I, thinking of. Uh, yeah. uh, which I don't know how well that was received or not. Um, looks like uh, mixed or average, according to Metacritic, according to Wikipedia. Uh, that's, that's uh, Metacritic is in the uh, '60s, so yeah, that's not really great. Um, but also, they I guess they were one of the co-developers on a game called Paranoia: <laughs> Happiness is Mandatory, which. Uh, very briefly here, is really an awkward situation because it was like released on Epic Game Store in 2019 and it got like terrible reviews and it was removed from the store like that bad and 
it was nothing's been heard of it since. It's yeah, like, it like fell yeah, off the how, face of the earth. Like, how does that happen? Just like, it's so bad. It just like literally like erases itself from existence. They were only a co-developer on that to be clear, but still. Uh, yeah, not, they, not also made, they also made a uh, Space Hulk Tactics, which I, I've heard of. I don't know much about it. I've heard of that as well. I get it, like j just vaguely. Uh, yeah, for, yeah. for our site interview as well, just, just while it's popped into my head, in terms of RPG mechanics, um, Ironic that I say this because I know I'm always introducing games on RPGs. Uh, there aren't any really. There's, there's a skill tree, and there's there's no enemy damage numbers, so it's not even like that. Uh, you you can you have dialogue choices, but it's just exposition. It's not like a choice. It's not like saying, "Okay, I'll do this or I'll do that." It's just tell me more. Tell me this instead. Okay, goodbye. That's it. So yeah, so their usually, uh, their usually, website calls it an action role playing video game. So it's not. It. There's no choice. <laughs> there's an ending choice, I guess. If if you okay, yeah, but there's two endings you can get, and that is the only choice in the game you make. When I hear stuff like this, I just wonder. I'm I wonder if I'm doing it a disservice. Like I've missed something, you know. Like if maybe there's one point in the game where it's like, okay, the real campaign's down here. Like the idiots who aren't paying attention, they'll just get this crap game. Like the real campaign's down here. Like, am I missing something? <laughs> Yeah, and I've never felt that before. Usually, I feel pretty like steadfast in what I'm doing, but with this game, it's just I see like some positive reviews. I guess some people just like turn their brain off and just played it for what it is, or maybe they had more invested in it. But I just, I just don't get it. It's just uh, so mediocre. It's mad. To be clear, last time I checked, the Metacritic for this game was in like the 50s. So your take on it is certainly not uh, like isolated. Yeah. So it's. I, 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 I was. I said this last week, didn't I? I was like, "Yeah, this, I don't think this is going to be great." But I'm, I'm happy the combat's pretty good, at least. Like, get get these people on like a <clears throat> slash game. Get get them on like a get them on a werewolf. Get them on a just being a werewolf game. Why have they done like some weird stealth hybrid? The combat's good. It's the only thing about the game that's legitimately good. You know, hearing you talk about it, I feel like if they were going to have two separate stealth forms, they should have at least had some like system where if you get caught as a human you get out of sight and change into the wolf yes yeah that would have been perfect like like even like the most like i think batman arkham knight if you got caught you could you could fly up you could fly up onto the gargoyles you could eventually like get back into stealth mode uh spider-man mars morales you can go invisible go back to stealth mode if you could go back into stealth mode it would maybe be worth it but you can't as soon as you're caught you're caught man Ugh. that's dumb yeah. Okay, so for um, all of our listeners who have made it through 20 minutes of Werewolf, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to play seven hours. Don't be sorry. <laughs> I hope that you've been enjoying Destruction All-Stars more. <laughs> ah, yeah, I have, actually. Um, that is... So I've been playing three games this week. Uh, one of them is East Nine, which is fantastic, but I haven't finished it yet. I want to talk about it openly. Well, not openly, like spoilers, but I want to do a deep dive of that when I'm finished. But yeah, you guys are right. East, East is awesome. Uh, I can't believe I've missed this. And the other is Destruction All Stars, which I played quite a bit of, and I'm really enjoying that as well. Uh, it's very simplistic. It's very like it's lacking a lot of content. There's microtransactions everywhere. It is very free to play at the moment. But when you're actually just in there playing, when you're running around the arenas, when you're jumping into cars, when you're just smashing the crap out of other people, it's a lot of fun. It reminds me a lot of Twisted Metal. The uh, the 2011 one i think it was maybe 2012 it reminds me of that in the best ways uh it, i i i wish there was more to say about it though i wish it was so a bit I, more I, I, how about complicated. this I'll, I'll i'll give you i'll give you a a, a, a leg to stand on um <laughs> basically i don't know much about this game i didn't know it existed until i started hearing about it like a week ago people had some weird issues with music or something but is, is this like a free ps plus game on ps5 or what is this so it originally started out as one of the launch lineup games for the PS5. It was unveiled alongside the actual console. Uh, and then they revealed it was going to be $80 or 70 or whatever it is. 70, and yeah. people were not happy, like really not happy. They're like, this is a brand new game that seems to be just one thing, which is driving around in an arena, smashing people. This could be free to play. Why are we paying so much <laughs> for it? Uh, I think they heard that and they were like, yeah, we're delaying this. It's going to be one of the PlayStation Plus free-to-play games in February. Uh, 
and then now it's had a much more positive reception because basically it's free. Like most people I know have PlayStation Plus, so it's basically free for everyone. Um, well, I mean, I, like I think there were I forget where I heard this, but apparently going off of Sony's metrics, like eighty five percent of people that own a PS five subscribe to PlayStation Plus right now, which makes sense if you're like such a hardcore like PlayStation fan that you got a PlayStation five already. Chances are you probably do sub to PlayStation Plus. So yeah, well, and I, I think I imagine. I haven't downloaded Control and Concrete Genie because I already own them, but most people check out their PlayStation Plus games. Uh, and this is the first one in a while. This has been the best month for PlayStation Plus in a really long time. And I'd say that's mostly because of Destructional Stars, in my opinion. Control's great, don't get me wrong, but here is a brand new title that really shows off what the PS5 can do. Like, it's a stunning-looking game. I, I, I love my... I said the same about Immortals, and maybe Brian disagrees, but... I love my stylized games, and this is a the characters in this. They're so well, they're so stylish. They're all of them. They're so good. There's Sixteen of them, uh, and I think it's the best starting roster for like a character selection thing since Overwatch. Which I don't know what <laughs> what people are going to think about. Maybe some people think that's a bad take, but yeah, they're they're really cool. Um, and it's just a fun game. I, like I say, I wish there was more depth to it. I wish I could have more to say about it than. It's fun. There's not much to it. It's kind of scummy that it's got microtransactions, single player content, but that's that's really about it. I'd say. Give... Wait, is it a single player game? Well, it's got single player elements. It's got an arcade mode, but weirdly, I don't, I don't know why this is, and it it really annoys me because this is this is prime free to play stuff. Uh, every single player campaign, so it takes two characters from the roster. So I assume there's going to be eight of them, so it's 16 characters. And it gives them like a bunch of little challenges. So it's like, okay, do this game mode, then this game mode, then this game mode, then this game mode, then a cutscene to cap it all off. Uh, they're really short. Like the first one took me an hour and the first one's free, but every single one after that uses some like the real world microtransaction currency. So it's about three or four pounds per campaign. And they're just not worth it. Like I, I would love um, more. A, a pound is a me. British unit of currency. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. They're not worth that though. The it yeah, they're just they're vapid. The cutscenes like 30 seconds each end. There's just no point. If they were free, they'd be totally worth it because you could train up a character, get used to them, you find out like what the motivations of each character are. But as it is, I'm not paying four pounds to have a minute's worth of cutscenes and then just some single player modes. Like that that's not on. I know this is free to play, but you know, I don't think anyone's gonna be falling. Well, I'm interested to hear your uh, further thoughts on East as a true newcomer, because we kind of have like a few people who have played all the games, including imports, a few people that have played some of the games. We haven't had anyone that's been like a true newcomer. I like how I just jumped straight to East, like uh, Destruction All-Stars, not much to say there. I want to <laughs> hear about East. Uh, so yeah, I'm interested. Uh, you're, you're basically saying that you're kind of going to bookmark that for next week once you're... That's next week's in. discussion. Yeah, I'm sure I'll have it finished by then. I'm about 12 hours in. But that's because Wealth came in and Destruction All Stars. So they they took my brain for a minute, but East is going to get it all back in. Well, so how are now. you playing it? Are you just like mainlining it, or are you doing the side content? Or well, Cullen gave me a very stern warning that I should do all the side content. So I'm doing all the side content. I'm not going to rush through it because, well, why rush? Uh, I will say this though. Just, this is this is a teaser for next week. I had about six crashes in the same place. I, I ended up having to skip the cutscene because it kept happening after a, the end of a chapter. Like you do these things, I think they're called grimoire, something or other. You do them, and Grimoire-nots. yeah, you, you know what they are. Um, and then there's like this big cutscene at the end, and it kept skipping. It kept like crashing in the same place. So eventually, after four times of doing the same thing over and over again, I was like, you know what? I'll just skip it. I'll YouTube it later. Uh, so I'm I'm hoping. Because Josh, Josh said he had a lot of crashes. I've already had like a third of his and his whole playtime. So I'm hoping maybe I'm just unlucky and I'll get lucky uh, soon. I, I thought that there was a patch alongside release that supposedly fixed those. I haven't I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any hmm. fixes just yet. Maybe, like I said, I haven't played it in the past couple of days. I've been occupied with those two games. But hopefully, maybe yeah. the patch was for the North American version. The European version hasn't been... Uh patch yet that would suck <laughs> yeah well maybe, maybe we'll come back to it next week and see whether or not your improve whether or not your experience improved or not with respect to crashes 
because it's really just kind of a it sounds like it's kind of, it always is unfortunate when the main blemish of a game is something like that where it's just something coded wrong or some some weird oversight or some issue that they just need to like button up that's not yeah. really related to the quality of the game itself it ends up just oh, being yeah. kind of like this fly they kind of have to swat away like oh by the way those crashes you know <laughs> hope we can get rid of those soon it would never be the sort of thing that would make me go okay yeah like i can't play this game or this game's not worth it it's just it's an annoyance i think i'd chalk it down to all right maybe a little bit more on brand for our website uh i'm gonna hand it off over to what james is james has been playing uh because it is probably kind of a formative final fantasy game for most of us at least people my age uh maybe a little bit older well actually i want to talk about the ever games first because uh oh. because of the nature of uh, some of the news this week i feel like i want to kind of end my discussion of final fantasy 4 um all right we will skip final fantasy 4 for now <laughs> for now um so Obviously, been playing a bunch of Final Fantasy and well, JRPGs in general. So I wanted to kind of take a small break to kind of refresh myself before heading right back into my uh, um, marathon for the Final Fantasy series. So uh, just randomly on Twitter, like a few days ago, I saw Go Nintendo tweets about this uh, game hitting the Japanese eShop uh, that I'd never heard of before. So I looked it up, and it's. A, it was a port of a mobile like point and click adventure game that had a bunch of reviews on mobile that people really seemed to like. So I was like, "Well, this is free. It's actually free. Maybe I'll just like try this out." And it's it was neat. So that's uh, so I I guess played through, read through, however you want to say it. Um, seven years from now, which is a voxel art style point and click adventure slash visual novel type deal. So like obviously James Core and all that, but uh, <laughs> um, story was pretty good. Um, it does have some issues. I did have some issues with the structure of it all. And I think most of that comes from the fact that it is a mobile game and they wanted it to be pick up and play. So the way the game's structured is that it's a bunch of different chapters and like each chapter is like 10 to 15 minutes. But each and every chapter has to end with some sort of big reveal. So it's like every 10, 15 minutes was like a twist. And the way that's like pace doesn't necessarily feel the best. And it, it gets kind of tiring by the end. That like at the end of like every like 10 or 15 minute stretch, there's just a big bombshell reveal. And it's like, eh, not sure if it really needed that. It almost um, feels like it's just trying to adhere to a structure. Like we need to have a reveal now. Yeah. Yeah, story was still pretty good. I'd say it's I'd say it's worth checking out because it's free. If you're like bored and you want to have and you want to and you want something to like play through, I mean, there's definitely much worse games out there than this. Um, What's it about? It's okay. So basically, you play as this kid that seven years ago made a promise to a girl to meet back up with her seven years from now, and it's the only memory he has from um, over seven years ago, because for whatever reason, he has amnesia. So you're basically recovering your memories as you're exploring. And then there's like all these other tropes. Like, I feel like as I was playing it, it I can tell that whoever wrote this game is a fan of the science adventure series because it uses a bunch of tropes from that series, which is like, it's blatantly obvious that they <laughs> that they've read stuff like Chaos Ed, Chaos Child, Steins Gate, etc. Because it's just it's just too it's, many to be a coincidence. Yeah. So it looks so, like I'm just do, I'm just doing some looking up on this game while you're talking about it. It originally came out on mobile devices in 2017 with an update in 2018. It was well received there. It's got a really high rating on like the Google Play Store. So. I guess I just yeah. don't normally look into that space of games, so I hadn't ever heard of this. Well, neither have I. I mean, and I guess that's the main reason why I decided to check it out. Is like, so many of the games I play these days, I know about before I play them. I have an expectation where I've heard people talk about it. So this was a game that I'd never heard of. I'd never heard any like anyone talk about it. I had no expectations for it. All I saw was that it had like really good reviews on the Play Store. So I was like, okay, well, 
for a change, I'll play something that I've literally got no expectations about. And I really like that attitude. I'll say straight up. Well, that's I very rarely do that. It's something I need to do more of, but I commend people who are doing So yeah, um it was interesting. I'd say it's worth reading. Um has a decent translation, it's a decent story. Um yeah. How how long was it? I'd say, well, okay. So there's the main story, which is like 40 chapters. I'd say is like anywhere between six and eight hours. And then there's like a, a bunch of extra chapters that you can optionally pay for, for like three bucks. It's an epilogue that's about two or three hours, something like that. Okay. So um, all in all, it's around 10 hours, which I think is well, obviously for a free mobile game that's a pretty decent chunk of content <laughs> yeah it says it's fr completely free until the end where there is a certain purchasable post story content which is a bit weird but hey for a mobile game like that's actually pretty uh, it could have been more scummy than that i suppose it looks like it says it's developed by mafumi yoshida who happens to be a japanese voice actress i don't know if they just share a name <laughs> or not uh, it'd be interesting to learn more about who who developed this game. Yep. So I might actually check out that studios um, and that I guess that publishers of her mobile games just because I mean I feel like and I'm sure I'm not the only one on this podcast that feels this way. I feel like mobile games are a blind spot for me, and I'm sure a bunch of people just assume that there's not really anything good coming out of mobile games, and the stuff that is good gets ported like this one did. But I mean, it's an entire market in and of itself. And like most of the Japanese markets, mobile games these days. So you got to assume that there's like more games out there, like that are being translated that maybe people would really enjoy if they gave it a chance. So I don't know. It's maybe a good excuse to look a bit more into the uh, platform as a whole. Yeah, yeah I right, agree. Right now we kind of lean on uh, Josh for that sort of stuff. And he's yeah, and even then he and even then he just plays gotcha games. So <laughs> behind, I mean, I'm back. not wrong. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Um, so the other game that I played that I had no expectations for was Cyber Shadow, um, which is the which is a game that's very Ninja Gaiden esque. Uh, obviously, wearing its inspiration on sleeve for better or worse, um, being published by Yacht Club Games, which obviously they were. Um, they're most known for, or well, really only known for Shovel Knight because that's all they've developed for the last like five, six years is Shovel Knight. And they didn't develop Cyber Shadow, but they kind of had to become a publisher in order to release the physical copies of Shovel Knight. So I guess they figured, well, if we already have everything set up to be a publisher, we might as well take advantage of that. So they uh, published Cyber Shadow, which is a cyberpunk ninja gaiden like very ninja gaiden like nes style and all that nin uh, ninja gaiden-esque game which is uh pretty good i'd say it has some issues i feel like um the main problems i have with it is that it's kind of really hard to kind of like clarify but so i enjoyed it it took me about seven eight hours to finish which seems to be about the average from going on what people have been talking about online. Uh, I played it because it's on Game Pass. It's on Game Pass, Xbox, and PC. So obviously, with it being a retro-styled platformer, action platformer, you can play it on pretty much anything. Yeah, it's got like this like 8-bit, 16-bit, I never know like specifically where you draw the line there, presentation. It's got some really cool art. I'm just watching a trailer as you talk about it again. Yeah, um, I feel like my biggest problem with it probably centers on the level design, specifically the fact that, uh, particularly later on, it kind of falls apart, and it feels like an NES game in the truest sense, and the fact that the level design doesn't necessarily feel incredibly fair. <laughs> um, it definitely feels like, and I've seen some people say this, that it's not afraid to, to uh, mess you up without giving you proper, like, um, warning just because it has enough checkpoints it feels like okay yeah the player won't be frustrated if they die due to no fault of their own because they're just going to expect that to happen sometimes which i'm not a huge fan of 
that's so that's so Ninja Gaiden that I'd argue, like like you say, not really in the best way. <clears throat> the boss fights are absolutely the strongest part of the game. I'd say the final boss um, section is probably the best part of the game, which is, well, you'd hope for that to be true. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like if it's a, I feel like with games, the final boss, the conclusion of the game should be the best part of a game. It should be like if a game has a good conclusion, it can kind of smooth over some of the rough edges and make me feel better about the whole thing at the end of the day. And I feel like that's definitely the case with Cyber Shadow because I enjoyed the first half. I had some problems in the middle. And then the conclusion, the very conclusion, kind of makes things a bit better. Like the over, like the kind of climb to the final boss is really interesting with the way it uses the mechanics that aren't really used elsewhere in the game, which is kind of a shame. And then the actual final boss itself, it being a three-parter and really challenging you to uh, utilize your full abilities was a lot of fun. Um, still not perfect. Um, definitely, This definitely isn't a game that I would have played if I didn't get it for free on Game Pass, which that's perfectly fine. Like That's really the reason I'm still sub to Game Pass is for games that I might not want to shell out money for in the first place, but I might want to play through for like some more literacy and all that. No, oh, I, I kind of agree that I I haven't really used Game Pass in that way, but it seems like a very kind of enticing way to make make use of the service rather than just saying like, here's a game I already know I want to play. I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope I can get it for free. I think it's more interesting to say like, you know what? I'm going to try this because I literally have no reason not to. Yep. So, yeah, I will say one thing that the game absolutely does fantastically is the soundtrack. It's just absolute banners. Um, I don't think it's actually up on like Spotify or Bandcamp or anything. So it's like, if it is, I might actually like shoot like five bucks their way just for the soundtrack because it's really good. Uh, if not, oh well, there's always YouTube. So but, the um, soundtrack is by Enrique Martin or Martin. I don't know who this is, but maybe you do. I believe the um, majority of Cyber Shadow was actually just developed by a by a one man team, so it might be the same person that did the rest of the game. Huh. So, which that's always cool to see, like one man developers and whatnot. Yeah, it's cool to see that the tools are robust enough now that seeing like what people can do with really tiny teams, and we saw it last year with Sakano, see it with Cyber Shadow. It I seems mean, like heck, Hollow Knight, like. Everyone's like heard of or played Hollow Knight at this point. The like bulk three of that people, development right? team is just like three people, yeah. So yeah, um, and now for the game everyone has been waiting for. Final actually, Fantasy IV. I, actually, uh, I think. How about this? <laughs> Sorry to pull out the rug from under you. We'll see what uh, Adam has to add to this early section, and then maybe we'll thresh your Final Fantasy IV talk with the Final Fantasy. 14 talk as you go into the topical section does that make sense all right that's fine that's fine all right so put a you know put a pin in it and we're going to move to uh adam has been playing a game that is not much of an what i would consider an adam game for whatever that means sorry to put you in a box <laughs> uh adam what do you feel about assassin's creed valhalla yeah so first of all assassin's creed valhalla is one of those games that i think uh, Josh has played a little bit of it, but it kind of came out during in November last year when all of us were sort of busy with other to other games or next generation consoles or what have you. And to be quite honest, we kind of just didn't really give it a ton of attention just because it's just like we were a pretty small team overall. This huge game just sort of landing in the middle of the month with a bunch of other stuff also around that time. And so we as a site didn't really like give it a lot of attention. Now we didn't review it. That's that's what you're that's what you're not, we, we did we do not have a review for this game, even though no, we, have we haven't review reviewed it. And I'm the previous two Assassin's Creed games. Yeah, and I might review it, like just put up a late review now. But so my history with Assassin's Creed is I played the first one as well as the Ezio trilogy, you know, ten years ago or whenever that was. And like, I wouldn't say like I love the games or anything like that. In fact, I was sort of just like, yeah, these games are enjoyable, but I had my fill. Like, I wasn't really eager to play more after that. And this was, you know, 10 years ago. 
And ever since then, I was just kind of like, do I want to play another Assassin's Creed? Not really. Like, I'm still satisfied. Like, I wasn't really eager to play another entry in the series. A couple of years ago, of course, Ubisoft started to, you know, transition the series to be a little bit more RPG-ish rather than just open world adventure, you know, with stats and equipment and things like that, Um, quests and dialogue choices and whatnot. Now, um, on our site, we gave pretty pretty mixed reviews i'll say for origins and odyssey although i know they're they're a little bit more positive elsewhere but valhalla just just seemed to be getting like slightly better reception overall than those two games and i kind of just figured at this point i was like why not let me let me try out valhalla and jump into this series that i have been laughs over for like 10 years and seven entries or something like that your decade just to try it out period uh yeah (laughs) i and in some ways, obviously, Assassin's Creed has changed a lot in 10 years, but in some ways, it actually feels like familiar, like it actually where it hasn't really changed that much. Like it's like you open up the menu and you see treasure chests and collectibles and and uh, vantage points and whatnot all over the map. Like, yep, this is an Assassin's Creed game where you have to there's literally a checklist for each area in the game where like all the stuff you can pick up or find or do. Um so it's very much a checklist game, which is how the older games also felt like. Um, so let me just let me paint a picture and put it this way: like, what is Assassin's Creed Valhalla? So you play as a Norse leader named Eivor, uh, and you are basically going to England to find to set up a new kingdom, if you will, uh, and to ally yourself with a bunch of the other kind of scattered kingdoms of England. And that is pretty much the structure of the game, I would say, for about 80% of it, is that you are going to these different segmented zones of England, and each zone has its own quest line, which your ultimate goal in that quest line is to uh, either remove like a corrupt, useless king, uh, to unify people, to, in some way or another, create a ally, like a kingdom or a group of people that can help you uh, and assist you in in your basically conquest of England, if you will. And so that's what you're doing throughout most of the game. Obviously, some of the zones that you go to are like story story required, like mainline. But there's also optional ones too. That like if you could go out of your way and go to this area of the map, for example, uh, you can go to like uh, one second here. Let me look this up. East Anglia. No, I think East Anglia is uh, required. Essex. And you do a little storyline there to basically get that te- that leader to help you out in a later mission on the mainline path. So it's sort of you know optional side content, but it fills out an area of the map for you. And that's basically the 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 the, the meat of the game uh, is these little segmented stories. Now, one part about the game that I'm not really hot on is that I'm not really a big fan of the combat. And also, there's just so much of it. Like, I feel like I'm just mowing down literally hundreds and hundreds of these random, powerless, pointless mooks all all the time. And it just, it, it kind of got old fast. And there was still like 40 hours of the game left. I'm just like, you know, sitting here just sort of sighing, like, oh, more combat. You know, <laughs> how long does it take to beat? If you can, if you do all of the, so if you do everything, collect everything, it's over 100 hours. But even if you don't do that, and if you're just like trying to do all the quests, like all of the, like the, the, the cutscene story-related quest-type stuff, it's about 50 to 60 hours. So it is still fairly long. Remember when they said, oh, this is going to be shorter than Odyssey, don't worry. Like, yeah. yeah they they backtracked <laughs> on that very quickly. Like one person said, like, the map's not as big. And then they are immediately like, actually, it's just about the same size. <laughs> Um, it's it's i think it's just them having their cake and eating it it's like if it's about the same size then we can claim it's close to being bigger smaller or smaller close, depending, yeah, on what you bigger, want. Uh, depending on where you draw the lines yeah so uh a one so i can't really say like how is this different from odyssey or origins because i haven't played those but what odyssey or what valhalla has um uh, that fairly frequently they're they're very similar with a slight difference are either raids or like assaults on forts or castles but these events that the game has like a dozen of maybe half a dozen like required but more that you can do optionally it's you basically take your viking team 
and allies, and you sort of are literally raiding some fortress or area um, to either find treasure or to kill like some target at the end of it or or what have you. But it, I don't really care for this this style of I don't know this 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 conflict in that you're basically just like roaming around some fort or city area or something, just kind of mowing down enemies again. Again, there's just I feel like there's just too much combat, and you're you're running into buildings, opening chests for loot to to build your settlement, which I'll maybe get into, and then uh, you kind of just meander through this through these raids, and you ultimately find your target or you get all the loot, and then you're done. And it just it doesn't it's just not interesting. And you just, it, it feels like every raid is pretty much the same. It's, just, it's sort of aimless. It's just kind of boring. I don't know. It's just... Oof. Like, it, I just, it's, it's okay. It's just kind of like, I wish there was more here. Like, I wish this wasn't just, you know, clearing off a spot on the map or, or whatever. It just... And also, like, actually what I ended up sort of doing with these assaults is that during these assaults, you have, like, different objectives to like you have to lower the drawbridge or clear this this uh barricade or what have you and i ultimately just sort of just started gunning for these objectives like and kind of just ignoring all the all the chaos going on around me because it's sort of pointless it's like let me just knock down this barricade because the game's telling me i need to and oh i gotta make i gotta take down this door so here we gotta i'll take the uh the uh the battering ram over there and knock down the door as fast as possible and i gotta lower the drawbridge just run over there and and shoot down the drawbridge and just kind of ignoring all the, everything else that's going on because it literally is kind of it's pointless to fight because you have to do these mini objectives and it's just sort of like dull if that makes sense and once you see like, like so the animations for killing enemies are they clearly went a lot a lot of work into those animations uh and it's very sorry i'm going to use the word yes it's very visceral with heads getting plopped off and spears impaling people and whatnot uh, but you sort of once you get sort of used to that, just like I'm kind of tired of fighting people. You see, that's, that's probably kinda, like my main criticism. Like, yeah, it, the way you're talking about it, it just seems like it just wore out its welcome. Like it just didn't yeah. remain compelling for how much you had to do and how long it was. And it's also like this sort of idea. Generally, throughout the game, it just feels like there's a lot of like copy paste in that in different story areas. There will be different like story reasons to do it, but you might end up doing an assault in both regions. Like in this, you'll you'll be assaulting a fort in one case and maybe a monastery in a different case, but it's basically the same thing, and the same things are happening. And generally, that's kind of I think true with a lot of Assassin's Creed stuff. Is just you know they're just ex putting as much content into the game as they can to you know make more checklists to fill out and whatnot. And it's just I kind of wish there's a little bit more streamlined or a little bit. More variety, maybe. How so. do you feel about Eivor as a protagonist? Because I know for Cassandra, a lot of people took to her pretty strongly and thought that she was one of the best the series had seen since Ezio. <laughs> so, how is Eivor? Uh, I haven't heard like anything about him or her. So, the how do I put this? So, the story of this game is sort of bookended by this weird modern day doomed day stuff that. I barely remember from the Assassin's Creed Ezio trilogy stuff, and I guess it's still going on, and it's weird, and it's it's all, it's really out there. But ultimately, Eivor and his his or her brother Sigurd are basically they're sort of like noble, like class high class Vikings that are going to England to set up a new basically realm there. And the main conflict in the story that happens throughout the game it basically revolves around Sigurd and what he's aiming for and what he's doing. And I won't like spoil it, but he ultimately gets into like Valhalla and God stuff and you know mytho mythology stuff, which I don't think is too unusual. I don't, yeah, the, trilogy the, thing, did that. the thing is, I assume is that, yeah. the Egyptian and Greek gods did that. So that's the, not... it's, it's weird because if you're just if you're just hearing about Assassin's Creed for the first time, you'd be like, wait, what? Supernatural? But I, I remember like. Some of the DLC for Odyssey is like, and in this pack, you're in like Atlantis, Medusa right? or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, that just happens. Yeah. So there's like a so it ultimately is all about like this relationship between Avor and his or her brother. Uh, Avor is, by the way, I think canonically female, and it's it's a little weird how that works. But anyway, um, sh she is basically, um, how do I put this? How do you describe a character succinctly? 
she uh she is she's kind of headstrong and like she 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 knows she's a good fighter and a good leader but she does she doesn't let it get to her head but if if people wrong her or like disrespect her in some way she will let them know and it sometimes yes even if if she believes it is worth it she will kill you kill you know someone who has wronged her if if she believes it was that's that was what was done so, like so a, she's like very character, character. Yeah, she's very, uh, you know, and of course there's like, there's a dialogue option. So like there are several times throughout the game where it's like, you have the choice. Do you want to kill this person or not? Or do you want to spare them? But kind of basically headstrong, very convicted in in her ways. And, but also she like cares a lot about her brother. And that's, again, like the, the crux of the game is basically how to deal with him. And there's even, there's even, like the ending in the game kind of, the, the revolves around whether or not you essentially uh, get along with your brother Sigurd or not. So I think she's fine, but I don't know. I like at least that this is one thing I will commend Ubisoft for, and it was the same with Phoenix and Immortals Rising. I like that they've got defined personalities. Like yeah, even if you can true. do it. Like, like your Eivor is like completely different to my Eivor. They're they're always Eivor. Whereas I think like yeah. in some for instance, sometimes in Cyberpunk, I kind of felt V was a little bit undefined sometimes. Like just just as the closest comparison I can think of the top of my head. Whereas I know who Eivor and Phoenix are. Mm-hmm. Do Did you play Valhalla at all? No, it's basically as soon as I found out it was so massive. I knew what would happen is I'd get 10 hours in and I'd just give it up. And I was like, I'm, I'm not going to spend 50 pounds just to, just to give up halfway. I'll, I'll wait till it's cheaper or I'll wait till I actually like really want to play it. And that just, that just hasn't happened yet. I was going to say, so, uh, doing, doing, a, um, <laughs> doing a dialogue choices with a voice character, I feel like is always kind of tricky. You play like the Witcher games and you're like, oh, this is easy. But I think that's just because Geralt is so strong a foundation of a character that you can kind of give yeah, him dialogue yeah. choices and it's easy. Uh, I won't say it's easy, but they were able to to give it enough care and attention that it comes across naturally when you play it as a consumer. And then, yeah. like you said, with when you're doing dialogue choices uh, with Cyberpunk, and then the comparison we made while talking about Cyberpunk last month or two months ago was Fallout 4. Both both games that have like a voiced protagonist where you make several dialogue choices, which kind of ends up feeling like incongruent with the choice and what's spoken it doesn't even make sense or how you can like play half the game as like really polite or then and then turn around and be an asshole later it's it seems like it's a, it's a tricky thing to balance that's kind of one I thing i do Geralt, like that's an example like off that always is the top of my head of, as a character that has what dialogue choices but is always that character is Geralt. i think they did that really well which is like, i know that's like brian you know i've played which we both know it uh, but then to see for, like V, I, I hate to rag on Cyberpunk two months after it's come out, but V never seemed that set to me. If that makes sense, like it, it's, well, it's we, hard we, to. We, we, we heard, like, yeah, we heard Adam kind of struggle a little bit, but then end up kind of coming around on how, how best to describe Avor. I think V is more difficult just because it's like, what what is V's personality? Like, I don't even want to get there right now because it's like, uh, how do you describe <laughs> that? Uh, that's kind of why when people have the opinion, like, there should not be any unvoiced protagonists nowadays. It's an archaic mechanism. I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know if I agree with that because you can play a game like Divinity or um, Baldur's Gate 3 eventually and th- describe that character. It's like, well, I can describe them 100% because that character is all the choices I've made. Like, I know, I know to a T who this character is because I made them in a way, or or at least I drove the car. Uh, uh, so, Avor, I guess, I'm, to try to wrap this back up to Assassin's Creed, kind of falls in that weird place where it's like a a bespoke character designed by the devs and the team at Ubisoft, but they try to give the player a little bit of say in who they are, and it seems like it's not the best example. It's not as strong as Geralt, but it's not the worst example. It's not a V. So. Like, for example, in places when you're asked to kill somebody or not, when you spare somebody that, like, Eivor is even considering, maybe I should just kill them, she is still, like, pretty, like, pissed off or, like, you know, you will get your comeuppance or whatever, you know, like, her her personality, it's not like she, like, flips on a dime, like, actually, 
killing is bad. She just well, like actually, that, that's know, so that's a conscious choice that the developers had to make. They had to say like, okay, yeah. if the player makes this choice here, we need to keep this character congruent by making sure it comes across in a specific way, and they aren't all of a sudden like this, you know, Paragon super, you know. It's it's not like Paragon <laughs> Renegade Shepherd who's like. He's either like the nicest guy ever or a complete asshole, you know. <laughs> so that's another. Uh, uh, it'll be interesting to play through Mass Effect uh, in May. Uh, coming more coming up on that later uh, to see how that comes across. You know, ten, thirteen years later, with the same sort of character that we're talking about. Renegade Shepard is really like a huge dick, and I, wasn't there that? <laughs> I think they wasn't it Mass Effect specifically where they said like more than ninety percent of people don't play as Renegade because people don't play people play as good guys usually. Um, but usually, if you have like the option to like kill somebody in Valhalla, it's like a, clearly a bad, evil person who is like, you know, for one reason or another, in a world like this, has lots of enemies and probably wants like literally wants them dead, <laughs> rather than just being a jerk. So, I so will say, this is um, this is sort of like an underhanded compliment, but I but I I mean it in a way. Assassin's Creed Valhalla does look really good. I'm playing it on PC um, with HDR and all that. It, it's a really great looking game. And I have seen some reviews sort of making the argument that even if like the open world trappings are all still there, like it's, you know, a bunch of chests and mini quests and whatnot littered across filling the open world. Yeah, filling out the map and that sort of thing. It almost is like, enjoyable just because it, the game looks so great you know, literally just like going sightseeing in a game and it's it's a, like i said it's almost a bit of an underhanded compliment like at least it looks good but it really does it's really nice it's honestly like one of the best like more photorealistic games i've looked at it's with hdr and all that it's a really great looking game My and i guess i yeah. guess i should also say that just overall i hope i don't sound like too negative on this game it's just sort of like I wish I liked it more than I did, but it's just, I I think it's more, I think this really is more just like, this isn't a type of game that I really gel with. It's just like not my type of game. So to try to like, it might be other people's more cup of tea. So, Um, so a couple months ago during the game of the year or RPG of the year deliberations, Alex pushed really strongly to put Valhalla into the top five over, I think specifically at the time, Neo two, but yes. So I think at the time you had played it a few hours, but you not enough mm-hmm. to really have as as ironed down an opinion. So how do you feel about that now? I I like now after playing Neo two, and I'm I I think I've pretty much finished Valhalla. There might be some epilogue stuff left. Uh, I am definitely glad we picked Neo two over Valhalla. I I'm always been big on like combat and systems and things like that, and Neo two combat is like orders of magnitude better than valhalla in my opinion would you have um, put valhalla in the top 10 still in my personal top 10 uh maybe almost just because of just i haven't like i didn't really play much more than 10 games last year and some of my some of my lower le- lower end games on my list were just sort of games that i i like just about as good as valhalla which isn't like i didn't really like them just sort of maybe some some p- components about it that i thought were fine so it like might sneak into my personal top ten, but like as for like the site, or 10. probably not. Yeah. No, I, I remember when Assassin's Creed Valhalla first came out. I was I said something on this podcast where I was like, I feel like that this is like their third go at this style of Assassin's Creed. When they make the next one, which will be obviously likely, you know, focused on you know it'll be with the PlayStation Five and the Xbox Series X, you know, in full force. It'll be obviously. Uh, I would probably play it on PC, but it, it this feels like there might be another inflection point where the next game. This, this, there, there's really no like concrete basis to really think this way, but I just have this hunch that the next game that'll be the one <laughs> that will actually like be compelling and interesting. Uh, maybe it'll be like Japan or something. Who knows? Because uh, people have been asking for that for like a decade. Uh, so this is their third go at the same style of game. It seems like it kind of doesn't really do much to reinvent the wheel based on your impressions. Maybe I'll play it. <laughs> I don't know. So I, I, I hate to like harp on this, but one thing I know some people were fond of in Valhalla was like, you can build your settlement and that's, I think that's pretty cool on its own. Like you can build, you know, 
a hut that like grow green or grow fish or farm fish or cattle or whatnot and archery and uh there's other like quests that you can do with like the assassins people or the roman people that you can get to join your set join your settlement and also create like a battalion and whatnot but in order to get materials to do that you have to do these raids which i already said were just kind of like man like i'm looking i'm actually like i've opened up the game i'm actually looking at the map right now and let me see i can count uh one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen raids i can do I'm just like, man, do I really have to do raids to get this material? Like, I just don't like the raids. Right. Just and how, how, many have you, how many have you already done? Uh, like just ballpark it. Five-ish. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh. I, I thought you were going to say like, just, you've already done 20 or something. <laughs> no, I did like I did a handful. And I just kind of like, I'm just like, okay, I've, I've, I've done five. They're kind of all the same. They're kind of dull. And I was like, man, there's still 16 left. Man. I don't really want to do them. So, counting with Adam on Tetracast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what these maps look like. There's just icons everywhere. Well, unfor- it's unfortunately didn't have. This is kind of a downer of a episode of a podcast episode. All right, is that, is that is that our cue to move to move on to something a little bit more yeah. exciting? All right, uh, we'll we'll go back to that bookmark that we set, and we'll go back to James. And this section might be a little bit soupy, and I'll just kind of put the put the thesis on it here. James will be talking about his experience with Final Fantasy IV, and then we also got some news yesterday about Final Fantasy XIV, and it seems like there are lots of reasons to be talking about them in parallel. So, uh, James, I'll let you sort that all out. Go. Yeah, so <laughs> this is definitely an interesting experience for me, because obviously... As I said last year, when I started playing through Final Fantasy XIV, it was, at the time, my only Final F- number of Final Fantasy game that I played. So going through the whole, like, expansions, whatnot, and having all of these, like, references go over my heads, I still, like, well, over my head. Obviously, I still really enjoyed the game. I think it's worth playing, even if you aren't a Final Fantasy fan. But as I've been going back and playing these series, like chronologically i've been starting to see all these references and now i couldn't have timed this better literally had no idea how could i have known so i'm about two-thirds of the way through final fantasy 4 now and the next 14 expansion is basically the final fantasy 4 expansion (laughs) because the uh poster job for Shadowbringers was Dark Knight, and now the poster job for Endwalker is Paladin. You go to the moon, a Dragoon's there with you. There's like these Final Fantasy IV minions are part of this. I think it's the pre-order now. There, If you go, if you pay for the digital fan fest in May, you get a Lunar Whale mount. It's like, it's everything. It's like blatantly obvious. It's like this is the Final Fantasy IV 14 expansion, which yeah. is which is cool. The moon itself, sort of like there's no other Final Fantasy game other than four where the moon maybe eight has a moon thing too, but it's not quite the same. Um, where like the moon is Final Fantasy IV, like for sure. So, but I'll just okay. So, I'll just put it this way. So, I did finish up Final Fantasy III this week, too, but obviously I talked quite a bit about that last week, so no real reason for me to kind of go over it again ever then. My thoughts basically are basically the same. I enjoyed it, but it's probably my least favorite of the original trilogy. It's fascinating just how different Final Fantasy IV is from the, from the prior three games that came before it. And you can really see how Final Fantasy IV in particular is kind of where the framework for where the series is kind of built off of sense, in the sense that Final Fantasy 1 through 3, there was a heavy emphasis on party building and having a bit of freedom to kind of decide, okay, how do you want your party to be, like, what structure do you want your party to kind of go by? And for better or worse, because I feel like Final Fantasy 3 doesn't do a great job with that, but Final Fantasy 1 and 2 do a better job. Um, Final Fantasy 4, though, it's very much, you don't really have freedom to decide how your party is structured. It's more like figuring out how to make do with what the game gives you. And that's kind of, again, I'll 
have to see how I feel about the rest of the series, but it feels like for the most part, that's kind of the structure that the series kind of goes with from here on out. Like, obviously, like, there's instances where it's a little bit different, but the idea of having a bespoke party with bespoke rule, um, roles is something that the series has kind of just gone with since Final Fantasy IV. I mean, that's pretty accurate with the slight, you know, consideration that some of the games have job systems, so that's a way to, uh, you know, set it slightly different from set roles. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's, I'm enjoying it as a change of pace. I still do like the option of being able to like mess around for your party, but for a change of pace, it's very nice. I do like how there is more base story focus in four versus one through three. Uh, I think I've, well, before I even started four, I saw people like kind of like ganging up on four saying, no, Final Fantasy II is the one that first had a story focus. And I guess, yeah, but. It not really like even the PSP version, which has more focus on story. It's like Final Fantasy IV is definitely the first real Final Fantasy that really went hard on the story aspect of it. I feel like. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a pretty that's that's hard to argue against. I mean, I I, I understand why people might some people might say actually too, but it's like sorta. Yeah, I mean, obviously, of the original trilogy too is the one that's a strong story, but it's like. Four, you have these neat little story aspects, like the whole thing with Cecil, like um, becoming a paladin and then fighting the manifestation of himself as a dark knight or not fighting, if, if you want to be technical. Um, you have the whole stuff with the way that you're part Well, I can see where people say that Final Fantasy IV apes a lot of its uh, structure from two in the sense that your party's constantly shifting out. Like you have people dying, you have people coming in, you have people leaving. You've got the whole, like, um, the story itself is different, but some of the plot beats are similar enough. Um, like the whole deal with there's an evil empire and stuff. I got kinda. It's, it's different yeah. enough in four that I feel like people that really kind of hamper on that. It's like they, they obviously have like their own ulterior motives and they just, I don't know why they hate on four so much because of that. <laughs> But um, people, been... people, people joke and not like not incorrectly that like a lot of Final Fantasy games are on some base level like Star Wars and Final Fantasy Four sort of is that too. Yeah, so. I can see that. Um, I you do still have a lot of freedom before in regards to places that you can explore, but there's not really that many places that you can kind of visit out of order. Like there's that there's. A couple of spots so far that, that are kind of optional or that you can explore before you're supposed to, but it's not like then again, none of the Final Fantasy games I played so far really had that. I'd say three had the most optional, strictly optional areas out of the ones I've played, which is one of the things I did enjoy about three, and I'll probably enjoy about later games. But um How far are you anyway, like in the story? Uh I just left the underworld for the first time. Oh, okay. So I feel like that's like maybe a little bit before two thirds of the way through. I'm yeah, not sure. I, I'm just gonna say very broadly half. You know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. pretty good chunk. Yep. So uh, yeah, I've been enjoying it quite a bit. I'm not sure where I would put it on my hierarchy so far, just because again, it's very different from the first three games or different types of RPGs to be blunt. Um, but yeah, I've been enjoying it. I like the characters, even if they're still not amazingly, it's, they still don't have an amazing amount of depth, but then again, Final Fantasy IV still feels like a relatively short JRPG by modern standards, <laughs> at yeah. least going off of it. So that's like, how much are you going to have? I do like the little, um, I, I like how the game uses stuff like the ATP system, which is new for Final Fantasy IV to kind of enhance the storytelling and just the party, like, um, the, comp the what's the best way to put it? I really like how the ATB system really accentuates the characters themselves and how they kind of fit into the party. Stuff like the way that some of these boss battles will evolve over time and it's kind of, it feels more like a natural like evolution because it's not strictly turn-based. 
it's based off a timer. So you have your characters like commenting on stuff like the mom bomb where it's like where you're saying, yeah. oh, it's going to explode. And then there's the stuff like obviously the whole you spoony bard thing with Bella. With <laughs> it's you like finally it's, saw it, it. Yeah, it's so it's it's cute just seeing them use this. And it's like really fascinating just how much of a focus the story is for an early Super Nintendo game. And obviously I'm playing the PSP version, but as far as I can tell, the story itself wasn't really changed or the dialogue wasn't changed by a, a big deal when making the jump. It's maybe a better translation, but the amount of character interactions and dialogue is the same, unlike mm-hmm. the first three games. So it's um, fascinating. Um, I have, have you said uh, which, which version you've been playing? I've been playing the PSP uh, Complete Collection, and I'll say right now I am very sad that uh, Final Fantasy V and VI didn't get PSP versions because the PSP version of four is beautiful. The um, sprite work is fantastic, especially in dungeons and towns and all that sort of stuff. The, um, it looks really nice because I'm playing it on my Vita with uh, Adrenaline, which is uh, kind of like PSP like e-custom firmware um, that people use if you still use your Vita in the year 2021 um, and has this uh, LCD 3X filter, which gives it small, not really scan lines, but it does, it, it just looks really nice. And it's, uh, I been, remember it, at the time, I might have some like bias of some sort, but I remember at the time when the, uh, the complete collection came out, some people like criticized it because it looked too clean or too like clear, like too, it, like it doesn't it doesn't look grainy enough or whatever and then i think that's when we started getting like the mobile versions of five and six which look like yeah, even no, more no, like <laughs> yeah, they'll be like okay actually it's fine <laughs> like, go back to that one yeah like i won't complain again i'm sorry yeah uh, all i'll say is that um i will never forgive steve jobs for inventing the iphone and giving square Enix a reason to make the mobile versions of five and six <laughs> uh. Yeah, man, like this is like if I could play the rest of the SNES games in four PSP style, that would just be heavenly. And it's like, oh, <laughs> now I'm going to have to emulate the GBA versions, uh, at, which are uh, so at, good. But <laughs> at least put the complete collection on Steam along with yeah. everything else missing from Steam. We've complained about this before. Yeah, um, I'm still not sure if I'm going to play uh, the After Years. I'm not sure if I should count it because it's basically 4 2 in all but name. And then there's, I like, will the say that I stuff. think like Final Fantasy X 2 as well as like 13 2 are more clearly like this is a written sequel of the game where the After Years, it feels, yeah, it's a sequel technically, but it almost feels like a remix spin off. It almost feels like sort a of deal hack. too. Yeah, that or, or yeah, or something like that. So it's like it's less. It feels less of like a true like yeah, it's a sequel, even if it actually is. Yeah. So I've seen people say that um, the After Years kind of just throws in some bosses from five and six. So I think if I do play it, I'll wait until after I do the rest of the SNES games. Yeah, that's probably fair. But uh, yeah, I, I think I might get um, get around to it because I am enjoying four, not that even long. if it's. Even if it's dumb fan fiction tier shit, I mean, it's still. I kind of want to at least. If I'm. The whole reason I'm going through the series, like chronologically, is because I want to have a bit of literacy with the series. And it's like, if that's my yeah. reason for doing it, I should play after you. So. You got uh, one of our favorite words. You have to play it academically. Just, yeah. <laughs> even if it sucks. I have to say. But, anyways. Well, is that why George played Werewolf? Uh, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> academic. I have to apologize for you to you three because you are stuck in here with me for at least half an hour of Final Fantasy fourteen discussion. At least. I didn't do agree you, to that. <laughs> do, do you want bad. me to set the table or are you going to take care of it? Sure, you can set the table. All right. Well, I'll, I will attempt to. So uh, Square <laughs> Enix had their big Final Fantasy fourteen announcement showcase yesterday afternoon uh, for us in the uh, North America anyway. And this was basically an all but name the, the next expansion announcement for Final Fantasy 14 6.0 which ended up being Final Fantasy 14 and Walker. Now a lot of this obviously we've already kind of, you know, teased because of the connections to Final Fantasy 4, the uh, the trip trip to the moon, uh the Hero of Light now sports the Paladin class. Uh, I can't really speak to it in much more detail than that. 
And then we also got a follow up. The announce the expansion was announced first, along with the teaser trailer about and then information about the new classes and. Uh, well, they announced one new class and kind of teased the other to be revealed later at FanFest in the summer. And then they talked about uh, the level capping increase and all the sorts of details that kind of comes along with an expansion announcement for an MMO. And then later in the night, they did uh, a live letter from the producer to talk about 5.5, essentially the last major update to Shadowbringers, which will bridge the gap from Shadowbringers to Endwalker. And the last thing I'll state is that Endwalker is listed as the finale of the current story arc for Final Fantasy XIV. And they had to be very careful and say, like, not the last expansion, just the end of the current story, you know, arc. Kind of similar to how kind of similar kind of similar to how Kingdom Hearts 3 was kind of the, the Xehanort arc ending there. I ah, really appreciate that wait, comparison, wait George. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to drill into the details of this and what it means, I'll hand it off to uh, Mr. Final Fantasy <laughs> All right. I don't know. Can we use? Can we call you that? Mr. No, Final no, no. That, 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 I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tramp one out. It's a good name. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I'll, I'll hand it off to James to talk about Endwalker and what did what did you take away from what they showed as someone who has been up to date on Final Fantasy 14? Well, this is just like a really fascinating. Like, well, I kind of said this earlier, but it's really fascinating for me because, like, again, I put started Final Fantasy 14 with like no knowledge of the rest of the series as a whole and now i'm like right in the middle of my final fantasy 4 playthrough we get the final fantasy 4 expansion which is definitely um, making me well I, I was going to be hyped regardless but just because i have more context and it's like oh i get that it's like giving me a bit more excitement for it because it's like hey i'll be you able to play whale a whale isn't like actually like a space whale yeah it's like Hey, I'll get to play a 14 expansion and actually have the other game like references not fly immediately over my head. That's nice. You'll have to get to <laughs> yeah. uh, Final Fantasy X before you get before it releases. Oh, I'm sure I will. Um, knowing you, yeah. Though, though, <laughs> knowing the timing of the expansion, I'm basically going to be just done with Final Fantasy XI once the expansion comes out. <laughs> Oh, I, I never uh, stated, but it's the expansion is slated for um, fall twenty twenty one. This, yeah, this was originally didn't supposed to be announced. They announced a uh, PS five version. Yeah, which yes. uh, I have a more to talk about with that later. I'm going to save that for the later half of this discussion. I have some thoughts. Um, so basically, the major changes so far, obviously, level cap increase that was expected. We got two new jobs announced that we only had one detailed. Um, we do know that there's another melee DPS job coming. We don't know what it is. People are thinking it might be it might use scythes, and it might use the maiming armor set because so far the maiming is just used by uh, lancer slash dragoon. So it would be nice and make sense. Um, be uh they announced a bunch of like system changes like so i am not a wow player i have never touched in my life uh i keep much like brian says he might check out final fantasy 14 or 11 or whatnot in the future i say that about wow we both don't actually mean it <laughs> uh, um i do know that wow has had like number of crunches before and basically they're doing a similar thing with the i think it's technically coming in 5.5 because they were saying stuff about like how the highest like hp that a boss mob has in 5.5 is 440 million no 440 hundred yeah no, i think i think it was million yeah 440 million and it's like that's that's a lot of hp um so yeah, they're doing a number crunch. They said that it's only going to impact the levels from 51 to 80 or 90. I think it's, I don't know. But basically, if you were doing like 50k damage with an attack and with uh, eye level 530 um, equipment in 5.4, you'll now be doing only 10k damage. So it's a crunch of about like 80%, which is significant the main reason we're doing this is because the the current final fantasy 14 is basically duct tapes over the shambling corpse of 1.0 and every so often they are given a reminder that this didn't, the game that they have created should not be possible didn't they crash like a test server because like of a number overflow of a damage calculation yes, or something like that yes crazy yes so, yeah, basically a reminder that Final Fantasy 4, uh, 14 1.0 lives 
as a curse over the current dev team, and they are never going to escape it. But uh, there are things they can do to mitigate the damage, and uh, Number Crunch is going to be one of those things. Um, so that's the main systems change. They're also getting rid of belts. Uh, Namura is uh, on Suicide Watch. But, uh, <laughs> so, why, yeah. is that? Why, why belts? Okay, yeah, explain that. Uh, okay. It's because they realized that there was no real reason for belts to be in the game in the first place. They were a 1.0 thing where you could actually see them on character models, and they kind of stayed as equipment in the current Final Fantasy XIV, but they aren't visible. They're, they never like have an impact on how your character looks. So they finally realized, you know what? We don't need belts, especially since we're going to be adding in more um, classes with the next expansion. They need to reallocate armor space for uh, players and whatnot. Now, I wish they could just add more ar armory chest spaces in the first place, because technically we're going to have five less than we used to, because the way they're taking the 35 like belt slots is they're going to give 15 to rings, and I think 15 to... I forget the other category, but so then there's just like a storage where you can only store so many of a certain equipment type. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense so, on paper, I guess. Yeah, and they just and they outright said, "Yeah, there's uh, five more armory chest spaces that are just going bye bye. We're just going to keep them for a rainy day." And it's like, okay, well, why not just add more? And they just obviously the answer is is that. Any change they make must be in moderation because, again, Final Fantasy XIV 1.0's uh, curse run run a thief. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so the main we don't know the exact plot points for the expansion yet. Uh, obviously, we know that it's Final Fantasy IV inspired. We go to the moon. There's going to be some aspects of Garo Mall that ends out the current story, but. As for the hows, whats, and whys, we won't really know that until May when, well, not May, we won't really know, start to know that until I'd say April when the first half of the 5.5 patch drops. We'll probably have some more ideas then, though, um, as is customary, the second half of the patch with the final MSQs for the current expansion won't come out until later, so probably closer to June, June well, probably close, well, they said it was coming out in May, I think, so yeah, May. So we'll probably know by May. We don't really have any idea now. We'll have a better idea in April. Um, I do have a question so about yeah, that, um, and maybe you don't know about this because you because you didn't play from, from day one, but do they normally do this sort of like cross-linking of the expansions where you have an expansion, you have three or four follow-up patches, then you have an announcement of the next expansion, and then the final follow-up patch yes. to kind of cross yes. the income. that's usually what they do. Um, they didn't really do that. I, well, yeah, they even did that in Realm Reborn, because you could see, like, some of the Heaven's Word stuff start out in 5.3, well, not 5.3, 2.3, like, just looking at the actual story. And they even said that, specifically, that, so normally, when an expansion comes out, the story itself isn't actually finished for that expansion's main story until the point three patch. So for Shadowbringers, 5.3 was the end of the proper Shadowbringers story. And they even acknowledged that with this uh, event because they said that specifically the story for Endwalker is going to finish with the base expansion this time. And that 6.1 forward are going to be an entirely new story. So what, whether that means that the main scenario quests for 6.0 are going to be longer than previous, previous expansions, probably not. That would be nice, though. Who knows? But that does mean that it's going to be a, essentially a blank slate after uh, Endwalker. And it, who knows what might happen? Because it's not going to be like, oh, there's loose ends that we need to uh, wrap up. It's just going to be, okay, now what can we tell next? And that, that might be interesting on a, like a logistical standpoint, too, because if Final Fantasy XIV is going to have a life that extends another decade and people are jumping in um, in three years and four years, like, will, will expansion, how do I get that? So Endwalker is expansion five, right? Yeah, or, and then, exactly. Well, yeah, it depends on if you count on what they call it for as, as an, right. it's, yeah, it depends on where you, how you account for a realm reborn. But if, if you're starting final fantasy 14 in 2024, 
like will whatever follows endwalker be like a jumping in point none of this like oh you, you got three or four expansions to go through like might might be like just logistically like how will they organize that is interesting to think about maybe it's kind of jumping the gun because endwalker is just announced and you know hot off the press but i don't know yeah I, f- I find that stuff sort of like how in the world do you account for that like when you're designing such a massive thing so anyways um the upper job um announced that we actually got gameplay and we got like some details about it is sage which is a new healing um job which is uh, long overdue the last time we got a new healing job was heaven's word so that was three expansions ago so we were overdue because we got um we got a new tank with shatterbringers we've had like so many dps so so many dps (laughs) um so I'm going to level with you guys, and people listening to this will have a better idea of what I mean when I say this. I don't know how to feel about Sage. It looks dope. It looks fun. I'm going to have a lot of fun with Sage. But my healing class that I have at level 80 is Astrologian. And they outright said that Astrologian is getting a rework because now they're separating the healers into two distinct roles. Regular healers and barrier uh, healers. Barrier healers being stuff, I'm guessing healers that deal with the shield mechanic. and So they mitigate before, damage more than just healing. Yeah, before, health. Scholar was the main healer that dealt with shields. But, astro, um, but Astrologen, you have two different forms or sets. And you have the diurnal and the nocturnal sets. And one was focused on regen healing and one was focused on shield healing or barrier healing. They just said that the uh, the Astrologen is going to be reworked into a pure healing class, which means that Nocturnal Sect is probably going away, and there's going to be a massive rework on Astrologen's identity. I'm not sure how to feel about that, because Astrologen already has had quite a few changes with Shadowbringers. So, So, I mean... As someone with no like horse in this race, I guess it kind of sucks because your build that you crafted and worked towards might just be completely well, messed to up be now. Fair, to be fair, almost no astrologians use nocturnal sects. Pretty much the only reason you would use it is if you were in a trial or a raid with another astrologian and it's like, okay, who's going to be the shield astrologian? And that's that was basically it. So it's not a huge deal, but It'll be interesting to see what they do to change it up. It's just like, oh, we just had a rework with the cards last expansion. When you talk about like these things that are probably going away, like or like these different types of healers, I understand some of it, but some of it, I'm like <clears throat> that pop team epic comment where it's like, yeah, I understand completely <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Doesn't understand at all. Nope. Um, but yeah, That's- so uh, the whole deal with Sage, which um, as someone now going through the Final Fantasy series, I haven't seen a Sage job in any of the games so far that uses like Gundam like fennels and whatnot. Obviously, between this and the uh, current uh, Trials uh, storyline and Shadowbringers, somebody wa- on the dev team, probably a few people on the dev team watch a ton of Gundam. Let's just say that. <laughs> um so basically, you're. Gundam. So basically, so Scholar has a book. Astrologian has a star globe, which is interesting. White Mage has just the regular old healing staff. Sage has these things called Neolifts, which are basically just floating, like stake like things. And you literally shoot lasers to heal people, which figure out how that works. That's an interesting <laughs> idea. Healing. Yeah, Cool yeah, it looks, <laughs> yeah, it looks really cool. I'm excited to try them out. It looks like they have a bit more of a focus on damage versus um, the ever healing classes, which I feel like is a good way of differentiating the bar- the barrier healers from the regular healers. Because right now, pretty much everyone agrees that that shields aren't as good as regen. So there needs to be another th- another reason to give players an excuse to play barrier healers, and if what they can do is give it more of a focus on a bit more DPS versus regular healers. I think that's a good way of handling it. And obviously, we don't know the actual tool set. We don't know the skill set for Sage yet. We've just seen a little video, but 
that's what it looks like to me. I feel like other players have been getting the same impression. I will see where it goes from there. Obviously, we're going to have more information on the uh, actual skill set and probably get the reveal for the ever new job in May. So, not much else to say about that until later. But um, as for the rest of the stuff, so we're going to the moon. They didn't detail what the new what new areas on the moon we're going to, but obviously we're going to the moon, so there's going to be at least one or two areas on there. I wouldn't be shocked if like half the uh, expansions on the moon, so we have three areas. That would make sense to me. And then you have like Garl Mall. Then we have it's all it's all um, <clears throat> speculation at this point. And it's like when you first have the expansion revealed, you can only assume so much. That's a lot I have of to say, to like, through too. I, feel, yeah. I always feel bad for James because, like, my Twitter feed yesterday was so a buzz. Of but the whole Twitter meme yesterday was, "I feel a disturbance in the force." The Final Fantasy Four players are, are <laughs> tweeting. Yeah, but like, it, it's clearly a big deal, um, and I can tell that from how excited James is. But just like the three of us are kind of here, like, I, I almost want to play it. Now, like hearing this weirdly, I, I know I'm, I'm going to do a Brian. George, I'll play it. maybe oh. you have an excuse to play it since the PS5 uh, version is coming. Yeah, it's, I feel like a Brian. Not <laughs> feel like a Brian. <laughs> you say like it, but you don't actually have any plans to actually do it. It's just I just don't have the time. I like I, you. You guys know me. It's five hours this game, five hours this game, five hours this game. I, I couldn't put more than like fifty into one. How long well, have you I mean, See, if it makes you feel better, I can't blame you because since I started playing Final Fantasy XIV again last year, I've dumped a thousand hours into it. Oh my god, look at that's a thousand hours. I don't think I've put a thousand hours into any game ever. That's mad. I think I'm yep. just happy just to be on the sideline, excited for other people, like vicariously, like, woo, look at all those Final Fantasy XIV uh, nerds all hyped up. Like, I, I'm rooting for them or whatever. Like, I'm, I'm just happy just to be like, able to witness it from the outside and i'll be happy for you when new genesis comes out i've actually not to go on too much of a tangent but like i'm kind of like i'm still excited for it but i'm not like people are like digging through beta footage or whatever i'm just like i'll just wait till they sell it tell, tell me when it's coming out and then i'll then i'll get excited i think that's it, me too because I'm, I'm definitely going to play new gen well like sorry sorry we can talk about that later we can talk about that later anyways um, uh did you want did you want to talk more about the expansion or is there more to talk about on 5.5 like the stuff coming uh, out? I'll talk more about the expansion um well it's kind of going to mix together because there's some stuff that's like new to expansion right. some stuff that's 5.5 uh I guess I'll, I kind of made a tangent for the PS5 version so I'll talk about that first off where the hell is the Xbox version I'm not going to play it but Phil Spencer said that they were working on getting 14 out on Xbox in 2019 and there's the whole Game Pass thing with the rest of the Final Fantasy franchise hitting Xbox. It's ongoing. Where's yeah, 14 on Xbox? <laughs> it's like they announced the PS5 version before the proper Xbox version comes out. Now I'm left wondering, well, <clears throat> it could be because um, it hasn't been until recently that Microsoft has finally axed the uh, gold requirement for free-to-play games or games that have their own bespoke... Um, That's a good point. Two weeks ago, yeah. <clears throat> subscription so that might be a reason why it was um, taking a while it could also be and this is the pessimist in me talking well final fantasy 16 is being developed by the same internal development team as 14 and that one money was exchanged hands for it to be a time ps5 exclusive i could see that yeah no i i think personally i think that might be the reason uh, the free to play things are interesting point as well i hadn't even considered that so, um, regardless of what the reason is for Xbox players, and I do know some people that were waiting for the Xbox version to play 14, I am sorry, you're still going to have to wait. Hopefully it comes eventually. But well, it, um, can be, it can be played on like moderately spec PCs, right? Yeah, it can, but for some people, they don't care about PC gaming at all. That, that's true. So, Final Fantasy 14 is coming to PlayStation 5. I'm pretty sure nobody is surprised about that. A similar deal happened with PS4 where you got a free upgrade from the PS3 version to the PS4 version. And now the PS4 version is on the clock. 
Yep. So basically, well, who knows? I feel like the PS4 version might last a little bit longer just because I don't yeah, know. I don't feel uh, like it's uh, yeah, as much I, of a limitation as the PS3 version was. So. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not saying like, I, I wouldn't <clears> expect <throat> the PS4 version. I, like, we're talking like on a scale of four years or so is my thinking. Like, it's not something to be worried about for next year or something like that is my impression. Yeah, at least for now, it's probably not a huge issue. Um, yeah, PS5 version is kind of the standard array of um, upgrades you'd expect. It's 4K60, though it was already 4K kind of 60 on PS4 Pro. It's just like obviously holds that resolution and frame rate with the graphical bells and whistles like more closely than before, I'd imagine. And there's a new mode where you can set the game to 1080p and I'm guessing run it at 120 FPS, which is also very neat. And they also showed off a little bit of loading time improvements, which makes sense because that's a a hallmark of the PlayStation 5. Yep. So very quick loading times, all that sort of, all that deal and whatnot. Really cool stuff. Um, I probably will never play it on PS5 just because I play it on PC, but hey, who knows? Maybe I'll get bored one day and be like, you know what? I've got all the things I need to get the Platinum Trophy anyways. I might as well just bite the bullet. (laughs) Because it's 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 all cross region stuff, right? Like I, I, everyone plays with everyone. PS4, PS5, PC, PC. Yes. Well, within it's a data play. center. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, though there is speaking of that, a new yes. feature <laughs> coming out. Um, where so for the longest time, if you were on a server in a world, you would have to. Uh, well, if you were on a world in a data center, you couldn't go to other worlds on the same data center. That was changed, I don't know how long ago, but now it's the case. It's been the case where you can not only are queues for like instance content, like uh, like a mix, mat, a mix and match of every server on, well, every world on a data center, but you could even visit other worlds on a data center. And that's been a thing that, uh, especially hunt trains have been taking advantage of, and I've um, taken advantage of a few times in the past. Uh, but the big whole, the big problem um, remaining is that if you were a player on the primal data center and your friends play on crystal or ether using the North American data centers as an example, you could not play with them unless you made an alt character on one of those other data centers. And it sounds like that's going to be changed though. There might be more limitations than simple, like, World travel because I said you can take pictures with your friends and it didn't say anything about doing content with them. So who knows? Maybe you won't actually be able to do like dungeons and trials with them. Hopefully you will be able to because that'd be nice. But still, um, having the option of at least going to say hi to your buddies in different data centers is going to be nice. Uh, I don't know exactly when that's coming out. I think they, I don't, I they. So that was with the six point oh, like the. Uh, Endwalker stuff. So I'd imagine that's not coming until Endwalker itself releases. So probably not until the fall. But who knows? Yeah, I, I've played both both Guild Wars two and Fantasy Star Online two. Have the same problem where if you're on a different data center, you can't. You know, you, you like, oh, I'm on ship one. You're on ship two. Uh, we'll, we'll never be playing together unless I make an alt. Just kind of yep. how it goes. It's kind of just kind of like one of those things where that's that's how MMOs have always worked. But maybe technology is in a place now where we can more smartly implement that where it doesn't matter where you play with these global platforms. You know, you could, I saw a lot of people saying that they hope they can guest or visit over to Japanese servers to play with their friends overseas or things like that. Yep. So it'd be cool. To and see then there's the, good. then there's a meme with the uh, community saying, can't wait to go to the quicksand in Balmung, which is, uh, let's just say <laughs> it's a uh, infamous, the uh, player base there. <laughs> um, Oh, it's like these specific stupid specific ball among a server. server that sucks or what? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, that's the one cool thing about MMOs, as I'm sure you're aware. So, like, different servers have their own, like, different, like, communities in them. And there's, like, aspects of them that are that become infamous across the entire, like, community. Stuff like that. Yeah, in Guild Wars is too world PvP. There's certain servers that, like, ran, like, really scummy tactics. So I was like, oh, I can't believe I'm playing with someone from Maguma or whatever. <laughs> but anyways, I guess that's enough of the Endwalker stuff. Uh, 5.5 is a smaller update. Basically, we're getting the final 
Alliance raid and the uh, near um, Dark Apocalypse um, or Yorha Dark Apocalypse uh, Alliance raid series. I'm excited for that. Um, we're getting the final trial in the um, <clears throat> the uh, the weapons trial um, series. So diamond weapon, obviously. Uh, we've got another dungeon coming up, so that's cool. Um, all of the standard stuff. Uh, if the even update, the even patches are the more like major updates for, uh, say, um, rating purposes. Obviously, the odd ones are more focused on the uh, more territory activities, secondary, however you want to say it. Uh, I guess the biggest news from the uh, live letter for five point five is that, and this is. This is kind of going to go into the weeds a bit. So ever since Stormblood, there's been a new class of raids called Ultimate Raids or Ultimate Trials, however you want to say them, where they are the end game for hardcore raiders. They're super long raids that take like 15 minutes if done perfectly. And it's like very, very hard, like very intensive uh, mechanics, all that sort of thing. Stormblood had two. Shadowbringers was supposed to have two, but because of coronavirus, the second ultimate um, raid trial, however you want to say it, has been delayed for 6.1. So after Endwalker comes out. And I wonder if that means that there's only going to be one. Well, obviously, there's only going to be one for Shadowbringers. Does that mean there's only going to be two for Endwalker? Or if the other, like, ultimate trial that they would have made for Endwalker is also still going to be developed and it's just going to be a an extra one. Who knows? Hopefully it's the latter, though I wouldn't be shocked if it's the former. So that's disappointing for uh, hardcore rating folks, but the vast majority of the player base doesn't care about those. I believe that the current metrics are is that about 5% of all active players that have a character at level 80 have cleared it which is small change. Like that's probably like 1% of the player base have actively cleared the latest ultimate trials. So it's not a huge deal. It's just a disappointment for folks that are into hardcore rating. Uh, yeah. And that's always gotta be a hard thing to balance where <clears throat> those people, the ones that are super invested in the games and want to clear all that are the ones that are make the most noise on the reddits and the forums and Twitter. But then when they look at the metrics and they're, you know, taking the time to craft these things up and one out of every 20 people are actually playing it it's like how much how much effort do we put into this i don't know like exactly all the data they got to look at to make those decisions yeah so it sucks it's it's a disappointment to be sure but it's also like well what are you going to do it, covid is uh, still ongoing hopefully uh by the time uh, m walker comes out it won't be a concern anymore though not holding my breath um but yeah Hopefully the trial is good. Hopefully people are happy with it when it comes out in 6.1, which uh, going by the way that the uh, the uh, release schedule goes, that might not be until like December or January. So that's quite a wait until the next uh, Ultimate. Uh, the other major thing that 5.5 is adding, oh, actually, I just remembered something about Endwalker I didn't talk about. So much like how I said that Endwalker is basically the Final Fantasy IV expansion, uh, the trust system, which was added with Shadowbringers, which lets you go through dungeons with a pre-built NPC party using characters from the storyline. Uh, they're adding in a new trust, um, Estinian. If I'm sure Brian will remember when I talked about how he was the dragoon, like job quest, like NPC that took part in the Heaven's Word story and was like a major character in it. Well, it Obviously, um, Square Enix thought, well, if we're going to, um, to ape Final Fantasy IV and your main character is, like, canonically a paladin now, well, we need to have your the buddy, Dragoon. the Dragoon, like, uh, journey with you again. And so he's going to be a new trust in uh, 6.0, which obviously means that he's going to be a major party member in 6.0 as well. And this might be stating it a bit plainly, but for anyone who's not aware, in Final Fantasy IV, Cecil or Cecil... Um, Ch job class changes from Dark Knight to Paladin mid story, and one of the party members is Kane, who is a dragoon. So that's where that's where like more of those Final Fantasy four ties are coming from. I know I know yeah. like ninety percent of people listening to this were aware of this, but maybe some people weren't. So there you go. Has George played Final Fantasy? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't. That is news to me. 
So yeah, it's so, very, very neat. Um, <clears throat> just a lot of stuff they're doing with the whole, like, they're really leaning in on Final Fantasy IV in the sense that, like, like looking in retrospect, like, Shadowbringers had a bit of Final Fantasy III stuff in the sense that, like, you have the Flood of Light, you have the Crystal Tower, that sort of thing. But it definitely feels like Endwalker is the first expansion really, really going heavy on, like, the ties to another number of Final Fantasy game, even if it's only thematically. So that's neat. <clears throat> so, what yeah. This, um, what was this part about uh, Anima of Final Fantasy X? Uh, I believe that's, uh, I don't, I wasn't. Press release just called it a new threat. Yeah, a new threat. It might be part of a trial series in 6.0. I don't know. They might just be like actual like primals that you face in uh, 6.0. Who knows? Uh, though I'd imagine that we're probably going to have some of the, uh, Final Fantasy IV, uh, <laughs> Um, boxes as trials in uh, 6.0 just because, well, everything else is is uh, Final Fantasy IV inspired. You got to go all the way, you know? Um, just to be clear, <laughs> Anima in Final Fantasy X was sort of uh, <laughs> flashy because it was a, it was one of the rare, you know, summons that wasn't like from an earlier game or series. It's like new to Final Fantasy X and also in the story of that game is like a very, very powerful one. So. Yeah. Well, it's also kind of a key part of the story. Right, exactly. So it's like, it's a, it's a very crucial, like, Final Fantasy X summon. But it's not so. like a key, like, it's like when you see, like, Ifrit or whatever, they just, well, they can throw that in there wherever, however, and they've always done that, and it's fine. But Anima, I mean, I'm sure he's appeared in, like, Brave XVS or all those, some of the games, but he was very much a, a like, the quint. well, maybe him or Veil vale 4, but the quintessential Final Fantasy X summon. One thing that is neat that they also announced for Endwalker is so obviously you have beast tribes, like usually three that are added with each expansion for like side activities, like stuff for leveling, for crafters, for gatherers, that sort of deal. Uh, they announced the first of the three new uh, beast tribes, I'm assuming three, unless they change things up again this time. Uh, and it's fascinating because it looks like the uh, new beast tribe, the Arcasatora, I think that's how you pronounce it looks to be saga inspired because it's blue elephant dudes much like uh, rook from romancing saga 3 so oh hey. i saw these yeah i saw these weird elephant looking things on twitter they, 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 now, they, have, they look like friends they're friendly yeah they're <laughs> friend shaped but um who knows maybe it, it might not be like specifically meant to be like a saga reference but hey if it is maybe that means that we can have ever like Square Enix like property crossovers forever beast tribes in the future. Though I'm pretty sure at least one of the beast tribes this time around is going to be the bunnies from Final Fantasy IV because hey, you're going to the moon. Guess where the bunnies are in Final Fantasy IV? <laughs> the moon. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that I seems what like they're called. The one is naming, naming way. way. Yeah. If I, I, I figure they're all called naming ways. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that makes the most sense to me. I, I feel like that's like they haven't announced that that's going to be one of the beast tribes, but I would be shocked if they're not. Because they're they're also friend shaped, and mm -hmm. you got to have some of the beast tribes looking cute. So it feels like it, it writes itself. They already added Numos, right? Yeah. Cool. So yeah, um, that's basically it for Endwalker uh, five point five. Kind of just talked about that stuff already. Obviously, Alliance raid, uh, dungeon a trial. Uh, not much else there. There's going to be MSQ stuff. Uh, and I do believe that is basically it for the major things from Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, the 5.5 live letter had some interesting stuff talking about like what goes into the development, like the time schedules, the calendars, like how they internally develop stuff, like what they, how they like, what like challenges they have to go through. Like they kind of gave an example of like adding Mahjong into the game, and it's like okay, well this impact their age ratings for certain territories because some. Like, ratings boards might consider it gambling because you can earn gil that way. All sorts of stuff. Um, Do you like looking really... at Gantt charts? A Gantt chart is the type of chart that they showed where it was the um, the progression from phase to phase. Yeah, it's really fascinating if you're into the, like, nitty-gritty stuff, and it's really cool that they showed it off. But it's also, like, 
Not if you're strictly interested in what's being added to Final Fantasy XIV, that stuff is just kind of like there. It's not really relevant. You have to have, you have, to, you have, to have a certain mindset because I saw them talking about the uh, number crunching, and I saw like <laughs> my my so, my social feed was people just like I can't believe we're spending so much time on this. I don't care. Like you just just market more stuff to me, <laughs> and I'm like I I kind of get it. I'm interested I, in that sort of stuff, but I, I kind of get it. Personally, I appreciate that they trust the player base enough to really go into the nitty gritty of this stuff and be like, here's basically everything that goes on behind the curtain. That's cool. Yeah, I respect that. Here's how the sausage is made. Yep. Absolutely. So anyways, I don't know how long that was talking about Final Fantasy fourteen. It was definitely over half an hour. I am sorry. <laughs> no, well, I was just going to say, actually... Um... With this announcement, it just kind of reminds me, it's always nice when we get like a new topic, you know, like I guarantee we'll be talking about this, maybe not most weeks, but we're talking about it probably at least every month. And it, it's kind of nice. It's a nice passage of time. We've always got something coming up. Like we always know that Final Fantasy 14 has the new expansion coming out. You know, you know what I mean? Like maybe I'm just talking no, about yeah, but... No, yeah, no, no. It makes sense that, you know, just the nature of this is that we kind of iterate. Like, remember that thing we talked about two weeks ago and then catched up on last week? Well, here we are, like, with another new nugget of detail. Or here it's kind of like a new card is under the deck. Where, yes, exactly. So, and so then when of, we say, oh, it's out now, we'll be like, oh, we've aged so far. <laughs> but yeah, now like I said, it's terrified. Like, I knew this was coming, but now I'm terrified about, oh man, I really need to pick up the pace for my final fantasy marathon oh boy well you've got time i think yeah but the problem is is i still i'm gonna play through final fantasy 11 i need to mm. i need to deal with that and make sure mm. i'm i'm ready in time for the 14 expansion final oh, fantasy no. casual mode coming soon we'll just have like a, a, a several hours long <laughs> running into the brick wall that is final fantasy 11 the impenetrable i'm just fortress. incredibly grateful that i have people online that have outright told me let me know when you start playing final fantasy 11 i will help carry you i won't carry you obviously because i can't but i i might just log in when around the same time uh, you're starting it just to I'll be like drag okay, you along hell? with me yeah, i'll drag you along with me so we can have more than one person talking about a final fantasy mmo at once on the tetracast this time <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'll Looking talk about it when the PS5 version's out. I, 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 I make this... If I don't do it, you've got audio footage of me saying it now. When it comes out on PS5, I'll create an account. I'll give it a go. Minimum five hours. That is well, well, here's you the thing, though. It. Remember, the free trial is up through Heaven's Word now. I don't Literally. know what that means. <laughs> Literally, that hundreds what? of hours of content. Basically, you can, play through, you can play through the first <laughs> expansion on a free account without a sub. Okay. Well, I, I will make the account. That's all I'm promising. I'll do that. All right. So if you're jumping into this timestamp, uh, you have missed all the Final Fantasy XIV talk. It was enlightening. I'm only judging you lightly. <laughs> uh, we are now <laughs> going to talk about Mass Effect. So obviously this uh, trilogy remaster was kind of like leaked and then all but confirmed and then finally confirmed last year at the, was it the Game Awards? Uh, so we finally got the uh, release date. Mass Effect Legendary Edition is releasing on May 14th. Uh, and again, just for current... Con I, I gotta be careful when you use words like current consoles. Uh, just for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Uh, it is... Uh, we got some... Uh, maybe I'll just hand it off to Adam, since you're the one that actually saw the footage of this uh, remaster, from the amount of detail that went into it. Uh, so what can you tell us about what you saw from Mass Effect Legendary Edition? Yeah, so... About a week before it was officially unveiled on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, they invited various outlets to kind of get a behind the door, behind closed doors presentation, obviously virtual, for what the remaster is. Because up to that point, he, it was announced, but they didn't really show it other than like a really brief teaser trailer. And basically, it is a remaster. I, I've seen some comments saying like they wish it was more like Resident Evil Two like remake, and it's like it's not a remake; it's a remaster. Um, so, Mass Effect originally released in two thousand and eight, with the sequels in like two thousand ten and two thousand twelve, and so they showed a lot of Mass Effect One, and it's the animations are from 2008 so you kind of have to if you're picking up this game and you've never played it before you just have to be aware of that it's like it's not going to have like same level of fidelity as a modern game 
but what we so we spoke with uh mac walters and a few of the other like the producer and the art director of the game and what they basically wanted to convey was they wanted the three games to be more unified in a way in terms of their ui in terms of how they look in terms of texturing and character um, models and things like that but of course they didn't want to be untrue to what mass effect the original game is or was or is so like for example, when they're talking about updating all the textures, because that's that's the main thing, is they're updating the visuals. That's the main thing, right? Like for characters like Liara, they they want Liara from Mass Effect One to still be Mass Effect One Liara rather than like having Mass Effect Three version Liara show up like in the game. Pointed, if that makes sense, yeah. Because she looks, she acts different. She looks different. She grows throughout the series, so they didn't want to like, they didn't want to be true untrue to that. But they did make some changes in terms of lighting, in terms of, uh, uh, like, for example, on Eden Prime. So Eden Prime is the very first, it's like the tutorial level in Mass Effect. It's literally the very beginning of this series. Uh, they they literally changed where the sun is in the environment. And this is sort of a change that, in some cases, I think it's okay. But in some cases, I think it is uh, up for criticism, is that it'll change the lighting and the mood in, ter- in certain scenes in that area because you have the sun in your, basically in your, in your eyesight now. But that's, that's the sort of changes we're talking about. It's like these light, some lighting changes, some texture changes and things like that, but it's still the same mass effect, some UI changes. Um, and did we say it's supposed to, it's releasing on in May. You said that, right? Yeah, it's in May. Okay. So, I I'm just gonna say now that like I played Mass Effect. I played like the first two games like several times each, and then when the third game came out, I played it once. I'm like, all right, I'm done. Um, and I've I'm not really that eager to replay it. I know a lot of fans are like they're, they've been waiting for this for years to replay it, like an, as an excuse to replay it. It's the sort of game where there are various choices to make and different characters to romance and all that. So there are reasons to replay it. But I'm just like, eh, I've already got my fill. And yes, it's nice that they are unifying it a bit. It's it, They're adding proper gamepad controls on PC and things like that. But I'm just not like especially eager to revisit it. Are you? I've already mentioned, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, so I won't go too long into this. But I just think it's nice to have a convenient full package for if you want to play yeah, Mass Effect Trilogy, yeah. here it is, rather than having to dig through like, how do I get this DLC? Do I need to still convert origin dollars into Bioware points? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, oh, I remember Bioware points. Uh, all right, but and so also the PS3 be- version was like a late release that was slightly awkward. So I, mean, I, don't, I don't even know if you still have to worry about old online pass stuff from that era right. of that, like the year and a half that those were a thing. So I think it's just nice to have everything in one convenient, like download this and you got it. Uh, with that said, though, there are two major omissions from the uh, Mass Effect Legendary Edition. One, it will not have the Pinnacle Station DLC from the first game. Now, the first game didn't have as much DLC as the later two, but it's one of the major ones it had was Pinnacle Station. And I think it was Game Informer, maybe you can correct me if it was a different publication, actually asked about this. And basically, it was the traditional we no longer had the source code. And it, when we finally found the developers of the original DLC and had it sent over, we found that we couldn't really reverse engineer it. We, there was issues with the bu- with bugs and with, you know, incompatibilities. And basically they just said like, in order to implement this DLC alone, it would have taken an additional six months. So they just decided we can't do it. Like it's, it's out of scope, which is unfortunate because it's supposed to be like not now we've got this case where it's like, this is the all in one package, but, And that's independent of whether or not you thought that DLC was even any good. And then the other thing that they've left out, which I think a lot of foreign people are a little bit more heated about, is um, it no longer has the multiplayer mode that was introduced in Mass Effect 3. Now, Mass Effect 3, the multiplayer mode originally, this is my perception, originally got a bad rap because it was required in order to get the best ending. For a, like a, for a short window of time. In order to get the best ending, you had to improve something. I think it was called like war score or war points. And even if you did everything in the game, you didn't have enough to get the best ending unless you played some multiplayer. And uh, that was considering still, this was like a single player series, it was like people were like, what the heck? So that was quickly changed. Uh, I, I, I hope my time scales are right. Like I, I'm pretty sure it was within a couple of months. Um, it was like after the first DLC, when like the DLC will get you 
enough points to make up for it or something whatever. like that. But then, scope, isn't it? Like, but then oh, eventually, the eventually, yeah. <laughs> what what ended up happening was that people found themselves adoring the multiplayer. They thought it was well made. They thought it was fun to just roam around in. And like I played, I enjoyed the multiplayer that I played. But I I was one of those guys playing it for the single single player stuff. Like once I got enough points, I dropped out. Uh, but I enjoyed it for what it was. And th there are certain people who basically put hundreds of, uh, maybe dozens, but I'm sure some people put hundreds, a lot of time into it. So to see it not here, um, it's just another one of those. It's all in one package. but And I think they also talked about this where basically they have to, well, how do we, do we have to involve crossplay? You know, we've, then we've got people playing on ps4 people playing on backwards compatibility on ps5 and you know do they have a different do they have an advantage if they're playing at a higher frame rate or things like that um uh i guess the ps4 pro version also runs at 60 frames per second uh i don't know yeah. about pace ps4 and things like that and then i didn't mention this at the, at the outset but the, they mentioned basically that they're looking at even though it won't have a ps5 version it will have like the enhanced performance forward compatibility. So basically it'll, it'll take advantage of that when you put it into a PS5, presumably, um, or an Xbox Series X. So I don't, I'll probably replay through this. It, I guess it all depends on like, May is far enough out that I really don't know like how how crowded that will be. We're, I mean, we're, we're already starting to see like, we talked about last week about Biomutants releasing in May. We'll talk about it's this. It's really this. crowded. Resident Evil Village and Deathloop are there as well. And they all like, they look awesome. So uh, also to put in the perspective, I think if you just play all three games for Mass Effect, it's like roughly a hundred hours for all three. Like they're not very long. Yeah, they're they're more they're, they're they're games that really like obviously they're not open world. Um, they are they're more linear and focused, but like linear with like the permutations of the choices you make. At least that was the right. idea. You could argue like whether or not they're really that meaningful or whatever. Uh, but I think that's part of the reason why these games have had such a strong following is because people play through them two times, three times. For like first they'll play through Paragon, then Renegade, and then later in later games in the series then I play through as a female shepherd, etc. So I'll probably just play through it once just to basically, you know, clear the cobwebs, I, not the right I will off. say, um so the presentation that they gave to journalists um before the announcement, I kinda wish they made that public. Uh, like I know there are reasons why they don't. Because the, the I guess broadly speaking Stuff is unfinished, not finalized, and you put it out in the public. People are like, "Wow, why does this look like this? Why is this? Why is this unfinished? Why does this yeah. look like shit?" You know, or or if it's in development and the final product looks different, like you lied to us, <laughs> right? Because it's it's like a work in progress. But I kind of so they when they released the official trailer and screenshots for this remaster, the screenshots especially like. I remember when Alex sent, sent over the asset batch, my first response was like, man, because every single screenshot has like a lens flare and it's it's kind of silly. Like lens oh, flare that makes everything yeah. better. And it's just like the, what, the footage that we saw and some of the gameplay that we saw was honestly like, yeah, this looks like a an upgrade, like no qualms about it. Like they're, they're upgrading, I think, especially like Mass Effect 1 uh, clothing texture was a big thing. Uh, in the original Mass Effect on Unreal Engine 3, like some of the clothing was like really plasticky. It almost looked, you know, it was kind of Star Trek plastic and almost looked like, I don't know, like polyester or whatever. And didn't, um, it, have some, didn't it have some like pop-in problems too? Yeah. Oh, afraid. yeah. Tons of pop-in problems too, especially on consoles. But uh, like they showed some of the like, character model differences. And to me, like the character textures and clothing was like a big improvement. And there were some environment improvements that I saw that I liked as well. Like, for example, I forget what the lava planet place is called. But in the original game, it's just sort of like it almost looks like just red water, like, you know, red liquid with some black rocks in it or whatever. But in the remaster, they added like some smoke. They added, you know, some parts of the lava are spurting a little bit. And like, yeah, that's appropriate. Like, this is nice. But then the um, screenshots are just like all lens flares. And like, that doesn't actually represent what we saw. Yeah, and there's other things too. when they're like, uh, let's compare these screenshots by, side by side, like old versus lens flare. <laughs> it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. especially when it's like Thane inside a building, like even if he's indoors, oh, lens yeah. flare. Yeah. Um, but they showed, like, for example, like what a dialogue scene looks like in Mass Effect 1. And it has uh, that old school, like, Bioware face, you know, like 
uh, front camera or first camera sort of talking. <laughs> yeah. But uh, like they, they talked about like how they changed up the depth of field a little bit, some ambient occlusion, some lighting, like in those scenes to make them look a little bit more modern. Uh, and there, they actually went into some detail, like there's two different types of depth of field. Like one of them is actually called like Boca depth, depth of field. It was like a little bit technical and it was sort of nice to see them like, go through like what they decided to do. And also they showed some gameplay in some of the environments. Like for example, the Citadel, I think looks quite a bit nicer, especially the water. And the trailer shows it like for like a moment, but not a lot. I think the trailer is like pretty fine as like a, a hype you up trailer, but I still kind of wish they just showed a little more than what they did. I um I wonder anyway. if this will be the sort of game where if you play it and you're like, this doesn't look that different because like in your mind, it's how you remember. Right. Everything. Mm -hmm. So I do think Mass Effect games are probably worth playing, especially because they're they're not that long. It is actually impressive, like outside of what the, what the game story itself ended up being or ends up being, the fact that like they created this franchise, this whole world, um, and it's it, you don't. There's not that many like space opera type games, really. Yeah, you would think there would be more. Yeah, it, Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's like it's like it's you know you have Star Wars, Star Trek, and then the Mass Effect, and what I mean, what other games like really do the star stuff? I guess just like well, fantasy star. You're you're you're, you're going to bring up some people asking like, well, Star Trek is science fiction and Star Wars is science fantasy, and like I get oh, it, yeah. but like come on, uh, <laughs> it, it just it just it fills a niche. It's nice. You don't get these sorts of RPGs much anymore. Like everything is open world. <laughs> Bioware ones. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Like Greedfall, Greedfall sort of filled it is more is probably the most similar Bioware-ish RPG in a while. Obviously, Bioware is not really they're 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 making a new Mass Effect and they're making a new Dragon Age, but they sound like they're both a ways off. So unfortunately they've been a ways off yeah. for a, a good while now. Um I do also I think this is a good thing that, that they're doing, but go ahead. Um Alex Donaldson did put up a little short feature kind of talking about some of the comparisons between Mass Effect 1 specifically and its remaster. Uh, some of the stuff is obvious, like it has faster elevators, taking advantage of better uh, loading technology. Um, New Game Plus is no longer required to get level 60 in Mass Effect 1, which is important because getting to level 60 in Mass Effect 1 will import into Mass Effect 2 in a certain way. No yeah. class-based weapon restrictions. Obviously, they've changed the combat like with aiming weapons and things like that. And the Mako, which is like the infamous floaty goomba tank or what i don't know what to call it uh from mass effect one has apparently been reworked though i don't like it's all like in words now i don't think they've really showed it much they say like it's got new nope. physics and a new control scheme but it's kind of like all like promise like the make goes better now we promise we go if okay. it wasn't clear most of the adjustments are with the first game because it was already fairly different than the others and the other ones really more need just you know just minor touch-ups here and there where mass effect one is like all right we have to like shape this up a little bit more so that's why we've been talking about it a little bit more often a little bit more than the other ones and a lot of it's like also just making the games more uniform in terms of like if a character customization option was introduced in mass effect 3 well now it's available in mass effect 1 and therefore it'll carry yeah. through properly i remember like when people would import their characters from mass effect 1 into 2 i it wasn't like a big deal, but I remember some people thinking like my my character now looks way different, and I think they were exaggerating. Yeah. But you could sort of tell that there was like the import wasn't perfect. Like, oh, I look a little bit different now. I guess I'll just chalk it up to the events that happened at the beginning of Mass Effect Two or whatever. Um, or it's like I made my character look really nice in Mass Effect One, you know, for the time, and but when I imported him to Mass Effect Two, suddenly they're ugly. <laughs> like it's the same character. <laughs> I'm importing it. But, so yeah, whatever. so hopefully that will work better and things like that. And obviously on PC it will support uh ultra wide so that'll be cool to see that i do know that some people have compared like how this remaster looks to uh fan mods from the original pc versions and i don't know i feel like sometimes people like oversell how good fan mods look i, I whenever i install like like i was playing new vegas recently with some fan mods uh and some of the texture work that they do i just think like they kind of they they might look technically nice, but they they kind of look out of place. Like they look like someone stapled it to the screen. Like oh, that texture wasn't there originally. I can tell that's been updated. Um, so sometimes like 
when I see these fan mods of the original Mass Effect uh, compared to the remaster, I'm like, well, I kind of want to see both in motion. Like, I don't want to just judge off a single screenshot or whatever. But I, I really wish they just showed more of the remaster. They they actually have been showing more clips on their Twitter, which I kind of re- I think they sort of realized like after the announcement, like uh, we actually have to like show more of you they, know they're what also... the character looks like now. And so they actually showed some gameplay on a few of the planets, but still, I was like, I wish they just showed more. Speaking of mods, there was a little, I forget who talked about this. Let's see if I can look this up. Um, but uh, Bioware has made a statement saying that they've reached out to the modding community uh, about the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. This is on Silicon Era, uh, an article that went up two days ago by Jenny Latta. Uh, Bioware talking to modders about Mass Effect Legendary Edition mods and how they're basically like trying to keep them in mind and you know make sure that what they're what they're you know giving them is something that they can you know kind of carry forward for years. But then apparently a, f- a few modders in the community basically say, like, I don't know anyone that's been talked to. So you could probably dig into that and see, like, you know, how much of I this get- is real, how much of this is just, like, well-wishing or whatever. But supposedly there is an effort to try to, even though the new remasters are going to be built on Frostbite, um, that to make sure that they're mod-friendly in some way. We'll have to see, I guess, when it comes out, how true that actually yeah. is. Please. Say that again? I guess I should also mention that... Uh, they said when they were developing this, which started in late 2019, that's like when they started this, um, they actually reached out to like like Mass Effect communities and fandoms, and they even said like cosplayers and everything to like get feedback on the game when they were developing it under NDA and all that. And that 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 that's like a good gesture, but a part of me is, is a little bit concerned, like like oh maybe over focus tested in a way. I don't know. But, yeah, oh, I see what you mean. Like you're just you're just adhering to like the whims of a maybe a very small set of like super uber fans, I don't know. But they 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 did do that. So and I think modders were a part of that too. Well, I guess that now there's not much to talk about in terms of Mass Effect until it releases. Like I thought it would be releasing sooner than May. I thought this was like a March thing. Yes, yeah, so like, oh. So it's like okay, uh, I don't really see like there's not much more that they can you know unveil about it except maybe more gameplay footage before May. So I guess we'll reconvene then. I don't know if we're going to review it formally or not, but I, I'm guessing we will look at it in some fashion. Uh, our our founder Alex Donaldson's a huge fan, so you know he's definitely going to be playing this. So I don't know if he'll be doing anything with it. Uh, but yeah, I guess we'll reconvene in the summer and see what we think about it. All right. So no more real major topics for the for the week. That we had two big ones, so that's okay. Uh, let's just keep running through about the things to wrap this up. We did get some more information from Nintendo's financial results for the third quarter of their FY, their fiscal year. Uh, So maybe just a few interesting things here. Uh, We'll see which ones we end up wanting to talk about most. Ring Fit over 31 million copies in less than a year. Yeah, Animal Crossing is insane in terms of like even relative to its own series, it's like more than doubled the next highest one. It's 100% going to hit 40 million copies sold, and there's even a potential for it to hit 50 million. It's insane. Meh. Not, not on the sales number, so catastrophic. <laughs> but I remember being so excited for that thing. It was like, a, this is going to be my therapy. This is going to be life-changing, like just so relaxing. And I get a month in, I'm like, I'm kind of bored now. <laughs> well, so, the thing I, is, though, I, I, is that that was your experience, which is valid. Genuinely, but like I do think that mass that not mass effect, see where my mind is. <laughs> Animal, Cro- Animal Crossing, uh, came out like the perfect. St- well, I don't want to say perfect storm, yeah, but like a very, a very specific storm. With, opportunistic, uh, <laughs> with a uh, COVID it's, and lockdowns yeah. and 2020 as a whole and things like that. Don't get me wrong, high- it, it, it was special when it came out, and I, I, I totally respect. There's a load of people who still play it all the time. It's just personally it's like when it was nominated for game of the year, I feel like there's, there should maybe be, or maybe there is a specific category for impact. So like, I'd say that Fortnite would be an impact of the year sort of game because like, you know, like the gameplay mechanics of Animal Crossing, I wouldn't call it game of the year, but in impact, I'd say it's like, it's a milestone, you know, but that's, that's, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, That's broad definition. It could get, always get murky though. (laughs) A couple other, the, uh, notes from the financial results from Nintendo, uh, Ring Fit Adventure has shipped uh, nearly Why? 9 million units, which, again, I think it's kind of in a similar boat, like people staying in, can't go to the gym. And it's got this well-received for once, you know, exercise game. I don't know if there's a better term for it, but 
I think also, the most interesting thing about Ring Fit Adventures sales numbers is like it released October last year, I think. Um, and so it's been out in the market for more than a year, but yet it's, it's sold like 3 million of its 8 million copies, almost 3 million in like this last quarter. I, I think that's due to word of mouth, but also due to uh, availability. I think it's been way more successful than they imagined it would be because I there's been people saying that it's been hard to find and you know they couldn't get it. I think sort of that those two mix of things is it's really increased its like tail, if you will, of its sales doing really well. Yeah, I I don't have the data in front of me, but it'd be interesting to see like where the sales curve looks like for this because I bet it's pretty non-standard compared to other uh, most video games. I mean, it's it's been out in the market for more than a year. It's like at eight point six million, something like that, right? Eight point six eight. Mm-hmm. And I, it I sold like it's the, in the last quarter. It was at like five million, and normally you're not selling three million units in like more than a year after launch. Yeah, in a quarter, it's not typical, right? Uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield is now up to a combined twenty million units, and Which that's is like impressive because this is the well, this is the first Pokemon game since Gold and Silver to pass the uh, twenty million mark, and these so. are um. These are sixty dollars games on top of that. So in terms of revenue, they're probably second just to the original games, I would guess. And plus the expansion pass, which is you know another forty dollars. Um, yeah. Unlike previous games that had like a third version come out, which you know, how do you count those sales? Who knows? Like it depends on how you block up. You know, to be honest, Pearl. it's it's been a while since we've seen a third version game, like a long right. while. But like, if yeah, people. But, uh, yeah, I, I, my, my basic argument is is with the expansion pass coming out, maybe that's improved people's like uh, reception towards the game and word of mouth and like, hey, maybe I will buy it because apparently that improved it according to James and others like in various ways. Yeah, so. not to mention the fact that there is no like third version like on store shelves. Like the tail for this game sales are going to be probably a little bit better than the previous. Uh, um, yeah. generations just because it's not ge- being split between the third version and the old version and whatnot. Exactly. So hey, there is a distinct chance if it seems even like almost inevitable at this point that it'll probably out end up outselling gold and silver, which is kind of crazy. I think so, gold and silver is at like 23 million. Yeah. So it's, it's got a few million more to go. But I mean give it two or three years, like it'll do that easy. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that tail will keep going over for a bit. People buying the switches for the first time or whatever. Uh, I guess the game that preceded that, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, they're up to 13 million total. Which, you know, it sounds like when you, when you compare 13 to 20, you're like, man, why'd they sell so poorly? But I think 13 was kind of like in line with where like X and Y and uh, Black and White 2 were. Adam, while we're talking about this, bring up, find a table so we know, like, so we can actually substantiate the numbers that we're throwing out or that I'm throwing out. Uh, and well, then uh, the the thing about Let's Go Eevee and P- and uh, Pikachu that's interesting is did those release in 2019? Right? Was it 18? the year before? Maybe. Let me, let me let me look this up. It was just the year before uh, Sword and Shield, right? But they sold a million in this fiscal year, so they're like that's relatively not, um, you know, compared to what <sighs> Pokemon Sword and Shield are selling. But like 2018, so yeah, they released, you know, years ago. They are doing really well. All right, I got a table now. So, um, like I said, let's go Pikachu and Eevee, about thirteen million. That's around the level of like the other re-releases. Heart Gold, Soul Silver was twelve point seven. Omega Ruby Sapphire fourteen point three. X and Y actually did about seventeen million. So, sorry, X and Y, I did not mean to besmirch you. <laughs> the years are blending together to me. Sword and Shield came out in two thousand nineteen. This came out in two thousand eighteen. Okay. Yeah, and you mentioned that gold and silver were 23. And that's correct. Um, red, green, blue, 31 million. So eh, probably not going to hit that. But, you know, I don't know if I don't know if we will ever will <laughs> be able to do that. Not unless without a major shakeup. But still, uh, Sword and Shield have definitely injected some life into the series, at least in terms of raw sales numbers. And the fact that they were able to do that at a different price point is pretty impressive. Um, last couple comments here on the Nintendo financials. Uh, I don't know if there's really much interesting to say about this, but Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is up just a tiny bit from its last quarter. It's at about a one and a half million. So I think it's doing pretty well considering this is the third release of the game. You know, yeah. it's released on Wii, released on 3DS. So 
and obviously it's doing pretty well. It's not gonna it's not gonna meet like Xenoblade Two numbers, but you know you're comparing a brand new game to a remaster that's been released twice before. So, and Paper Mario: The Origami King is up to three million. It was at two point eight last quarter. So, which I think does make it like I, I think Super Paper Mario was close to that. It's that that's basically what you're comparing with in terms of what's the most successful Paper Mario game, and the one the Super Paper Mario on Wii was actually was it. I'm not sure if it still is or not. Uh, let's see. I am pulling up an article from Nintendo Life from last year about the start of Origami King. And it says that the lifetime sales of Super Paper Mario were only a half million. Does that seem right? Wait, that doesn't that seem right. That, that is not right. It's Mario. Come on. All right. I don't trust you, Nintendo Life. <laughs> damn you <laughs> oh the, here here's another one uh super paper mario most lifetime sales 4.23 million that makes that's sense. So, what, that's much more like it so it's 4 million so it's so yeah so so there's made, like a video game that, but, sales uh, wiki that um it's not like vg charts or anything like that it actually has like citations for it but i went there and it says yeah 4.23 for super paper mario and there's a link mm -hmm. to uh an actual source so sounds right i know i know some nintendo sales like numbers a, a lot obviously a lot of them come from uh um nintendo's like financials but you can also get numbers from like it's like japanese warehouse white papers like how much they are moving and you some people like sift through those <clears throat> and get sales numbers too so but yeah four million for super Paper mario definitely seems much more appropriate than half a million so yeah, so it seems like Origami King. I, I think it's basically just that the pie of people playing these games is bigger. So, okay. and uh, I wonder, I one? wonder what. Uh, sorry, just to stick on this for just another moment. Like Intelligent Systems, we know that they didn't. Have, they only had like some key staff on Three Houses. They have their Paper Mario team. We knew, like we had speculated that a Paper Mario announcement and release was probably not far off you know, last year, a year ago, because they hadn't been, you know, just, they had to be making something, right? Like, and they hadn't put anything out. So, it, and Paper Mario is still an active franchise, so that wasn't too big of a surprise that they were making something. But still, it's like, I wonder if they're actively working on another Fire Emblem game. Um, there's been some murmurs, like, what if they bring back Advance Wars? It's just kind of fun to think about. On another bit of uh, news that we might have got more discussion out of this if Josh was here, but Judgment, the Yakuza spinoff, will be releasing for PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, and Google Stadia <laughs> on <laughs> April 23rd. Uh, Very then, unfortunate timing for that, considering like no PC version included in this, for now at least, and uh, Stadia... Literally the same day, Stadia announced that, yeah, we're acting all our first party team. We're just going to be third party, which going off of uh, Google's history, that doesn't exactly inspire confidence in the platform remaining much longer. <laughs> we haven't even talked about Stadia. I, it's not really interesting. Well, what yet. if we had? We haven't really had a reason. I, to I like how I like how I like how you immediately like kneecapped you. We haven't talked about Stadia. <laughs> I guess it's not interesting. <laughs> That's which is unfortunately just kind of where it's at. Um so it, people have like dug through files and done some detective work, quote unquote, to try to determine like how long is this temporary exclusive on PC going to be like, apparently some of the marketing pages, the Stadia logo is marked as a Steam logo. People are using that as evidence as it was changed last minute, you know, but it could also just be that they were borrowing from a template that didn't change the file name or something. You could, you know, th there's no concrete proof of anything as far as I know, uh, but yeah, it's not coming out on Steam or Epic or any other traditional PC storefront. It's ju it'll just be the next gen consoles and Stadia. And then on top of that news, which already is kind of a bit wonky, they did release a few compare. Well, they released a few screenshots, which have then, after the fact, started being compared to the PS4 version. And you can sort of see some very clear differences in like the lighting and the character models, where. A lot of people have come off the cuff and said that they believe the PlayStation 4 version looks better. And I think the PlayStation 4 version, having not played this game, it looks more stylized and distinct. Yeah. Where yeah. 
Uh, the PS5 version, I think it might technically look more realistic, but less striking. Like, mm. it's it's interesting. It's, it's hard to put into words because it's still kind of like a realistic styled game. But the PS4 version had just a little bit of the way the characters, like the color of their skin and like there's just a stylization of the lighting. It, wa- it wasn't trying to be photorealistic. And then I feel like the PS5 version is trying to be like technically more impressive. But I don't know if it comes through as strongly like in the output. It doesn't look as... It is, it, some people just say I think it looks worse, and you know, I I can see why they would think why they would think that. Um, so it's coming to PS5 and Xbox Series. It looks a bit different. Other than that, I don't know if like uh, there's much more to say on this. I, I think I think when when they literally just announced like Yakuza's three, four, five, and six coming to PC like a month ago, it, people were sort of at that point were like, well, that's the whole Yakuza series. You, now you just got to get judgment on PC or Xbox, right? And so and the monkey's paw. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's like, well, I guess it's getting Xbox, like, it's not even Xbox One, even, it's Xbox Series. Um, right, yeah, no Xbox One version. So, it's like, yep, it's coming to Xbox, but not PC, and I think, you know, just, I think that's a reasonable thing that people are going to be wanting and wondering why it's not, considering, like, the other the other games were literally just announced. So, like, here, so. here's, here's Like a Dragon coming to PC day and day. We've announced literally that all four remaining Yakuza games are coming to PC before, like, spring. So this just PC, feels like a weird. Don't know her. Yeah, yeah, this just feels like a weird step back. Uh, try to be a little bit more positive. It will increase the frame rate from thirty to sixty, improve loading times. It includes all the DLC, which I've heard is not very good. But <laughs> there you go. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Judgment is. I've heard it's a really great game. Some people say it's the best Yakuza game, which I don't know if that's. Yeah, like, I've heard that. Is that like that makes sense though? If it's different enough from Yakuza, there's going to be inevitably. A subset of people who think like this style suits me more than the traditional yakuza game style or what have you but i it sounds i know josh has a lot of good things to say about this game so i'm definitely interested in playing it for the first time i I missed it the first time around just one of those too many games at once or things but i think i will make the time for it this time i just wonder though like if you are the sort of person where you look at the comparison and you think i think the ps4 version looks way better like why wouldn't you just play that on the ps5 if that gives you like most of the way there without the, the drawback. Yeah, frame rate's a big one, I think. Oh, it wouldn't play yeah. at a higher frame rate in backwards compatibility mode? No. Probably not. Because it's capped, I guess. Like, there you I go. Mean, that, that, that answers my question. Yeah. Well, it's, it'll, it'll be coming out for those consoles uh, on April 23rd. So I guess maybe if George plays through it, we'll talk about it then. We'll see if it's an improvement. Uh, well, I guess we won't be able to talk about that unless someone like Josh plays it and really compares it side by side. So I wonder if we'll be reconvening in like three months and be like, aha, it's coming on PC anyway, or, or whatever. <laughs> if it was coming out on PC day and date, I'd probably put it. Well, actually, who am I kidding? Uh, I might as well wait to see if it comes out on PC just because I'm, I, I'm not going to play it on PS5 day one anyways. So. Yeah. Well, I'm sort of, I'm sort of like, uh, I didn't talk about it at the start of the cast, but I just finished Yakuza three. I'm planning on at some point in the next week or so moving on to four and five and six. So at this point, like by April, I'd probably be at a place where you know judgment is like, all right, I guess this is what I have left. Uh, with, a, with you know, there's also like the other <laughs> spinoffs like Dead Souls and Kenzon and all that. But um, uh, well, I guess the, I guess and uh, localization. Come right. on, second. But I guess we'll talk about this in April and see if it comes through in the uh, in the remaster. Another release coming out in summer. I don't know if there's a lot to talk about here, but Chris Tales now has a new release date in July. We don't know what that date is. We just know that it's in July. Uh, so this game was originally supposed to come out last year, got delayed. Really can't fault them for that because last year was a, a bit of a mess. So... This is the uh, indie game from the Colombian studio, Dreams Unincorporated. Sorry, Uncorporated. Uh, or not Brazilian, Colombian. Did yeah, you right said thing? Colombian. You, yeah, oh. you said the right thing. All right. I You're was correcting really, yourself uh, when you didn't need to. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, it, it's, it's, got a, it's a really gorgeous game. It always trends well when we put it on Twitter just because of the GIFs and, this the, is, and the videos of it. This game, is, it. this game is nice because I feel like they have shown quite a bit of it. So you can get a pretty good taste of like, this is what it appears to be. 
so there's no second guessing like if this game is i mean obviously we don't know exactly how well it like all comes together without playing it but like i think they've given a pretty good impression like this is what the this game, game is aiming to if, be this is a game where if uh, zach was still part of the site he would probably be talking up like a huge storm about it <laughs> It's one of those things I'm since, we've co- since, since we've covered it so often, like I feel like I'm kind of almost tired of it, like unfair, like irrationally. So yeah, but I don't it, mean. it's just cause like whenever you find the, the trailers for this, they go through like the same key points and the same overview of like how the game plays. Like, yeah, I've seen this. Yeah, I've seen this, but you know, not everyone has. And there is something that's a bit earnest about it. Like you said, where it's like, like this is their, this is their studio's first major product. It's gotten, you know, a lot of good like impressions in terms of people who have seen trailers or played the demos on steam and they've been really open about it. Like they put a demo up on steam, then they updated that demo. Uh, like there's no really questions about like, what are they hiding from us? Or like, is there some sort of like marketing, you know, veil here that's being deceptive? Like, no, like I feel like this studio is like really earnest and there's something just genuine about the, at least the ramp up to this game. Hopefully this sticks the landing. We don't know yet, but, uh, anyways, think get more RPGs for the year that is rapidly becoming a really big year for RPGs. Yeah. We mentioned like in early January about like, we don't, we don't know much about what to expect past April ish or May ish, but, or at least not even up to May, but all of a sudden like, bam, Mass Effect, bam, you, uh, bio me and bam, Chris Tales. like here it all comes, I guess, judgment. And I'm April, still wondering April. like when we like, already knew that, new 14 expansion was coming so i guess we're not really counting that because it's like it was expected right but also we're wondering like there's bravely default coming out we're wondering about when when is the smt nocturne remaster coming out because that's already out in japan presumably uh shungami tensei uh five will be this year so yeah i assume later in the year but who knows (laughs) yep and the last bit of news uh was an announcement for the Atelier Mystery Trilogy Deluxe Pack is releasing for PlayStation 4, Switch, and Steam on April 22nd. Now, when I saw this, I actually had to ask James, like, wait, didn't this trilogy also come out already? And then you had to correct me because, like, what, what, what is this trilogy and what is the other trilogy as someone from an outsider? So, so um, okay. The way that Gus releases the Atelier games is that they release them in trilogies of three, and each trilogy is unrelated from the other trilogies. But recently, they've been re-releasing, porting over some of the earlier trilogies to modern platforms. So they they uh, ported the first three Arlen games because that's no longer a trilogy because Lulua, uh, Lulua makes it a quadrilogy. Uh, Technology. Tetralogy. Sorry. I've been I've been told that I've been told that quadrilogy is not a word. Which, like, if you look at the prefix and suffix of quad and all of you, it's they don't match. So I guess it's tetralogy is proper. Okay, tetralogy. Got it. <laughs> um, <Quadricast. laughs> so, so that got um, ported uh, last year. We had the uh, dusk trilogy ported, which was Aisha, was. Eska and Logi or Eskology, Eska and Logi. I just Eskology. realized. The other day, <laughs> that the reason why it's Eska and Logi is because the the uh, um, signifier for and in Japanese is to, so it's esca- eschatology. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a pun. <laughs> Amazing, uh, but um, so yeah, there's that. Um, shall we? That's the Dust Trilogy pack, and then the trilogy before the Ryza games that have been coming out. Um, was the Mysterious Trilogy, which was uh, Sophie, Friedrich, and um, Libby and Suell. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yep. And so, technically, those three games came out on PS4 already. So it's weird that they're getting a trilogy pack now, but there's obviously some additions, like... uh, I think Sophie, Sophie has a new costume. Yeah, Sophie has a new costume, and I believe there's like a new. No, Lydia and Suell has a new, like, uh, kind of side so I, story thing. From what I understand, Lydia and Suell, yeah, Lydia and Suell, what I, from what I understand, that game, like, they go into like these different painting worlds. They use like the structure of the game, and they added a painting world based on the other spinoff. Which is no legendary. legendary. Exactly. Yeah. So they added a world. Yeah. So yeah, I'm assuming these these packs also come with uh, DLC and whatnot too. Maybe not all of it, but 
probably uh, some it's of gonna it. be interesting to see what happens with uh, Liddy and Suell on Switch because the first two Mysterious games didn't get Switch ports, but Liddy and Suell did. But it was like the first, I want to say it's the first like Atelier that came out on Switch. So the port and was it was apparently a really terrible port. Yeah, so it might, yeah. but like looking at Rise of One and Two, the ports are like much improved now. So I wonder if the Liddy and Suell port is going to get some upgrades on Switch or if it's just going to be the same old, same old. And for that matter, like it's like all three of these games are already on on Steam. Uh, so, are those PC ports going to be upgraded? Uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to have to buy them separately because Gusts Koei Tecmo. But if they're going to do that, you at least hope that the ports would be improved. So hopefully, <laughs> but we'll see. It's um, definitely a. Um, I feel like this is going to be a bit more of a messy release just because first off, the Mysterious Trilogy, from what I've seen, has a lot more inherent issues. So there is room for it to be improved, but also due to the fact that they're already on PS4, they're already, like one of them at least is already on Switch, all of them are already on PC, it's going to be a bit more messy in regards to, wait a second, why do I have to pay for this again to get the upgrades? Why can't I just spend money to get my current versions upgraded to the new releases? And, and, and that's unfortunately, be fun to see. We, we, yeah, we've seen in recent time, like with the same sort of thing happened with Dragon Quest XI, where it was just put up on Steam as a separate version of the game. They had to pay for it. You can't even get the original anymore, like literally delisted. Like, and every single publisher has a different way of how they approach that. So, so yeah, we'll see what happens. There are a few other small bit pieces of news that we've covered on the website, uh, such as some like a gameplay feature trailer for story of seasons pioneers of olive town we got a new uh screenshots for bravely default 2 talking about new asterisk holders spell fencer phantom judgment and arcanist uh, a few other like indie games that we've covered i just don't know if we can get a lot of discussion going about those like for for me at this point for bravely default 2 like, I'm like all right i've seen enough like when's the game coming out <laughs> like i get to that point pretty early like i see like one or two trailers and i'm like all right i don't need any kind of I wonder if I should play Bravely Default 2, because, like, with the timing, I should probably be finished with, like, Final Fantasy V right around the time Bravely Default 2 comes out. It's like, hey, that that's a, that would be a good coincidence. I'm sort of at the point where I wish Bravely Default and Bravely Second were available on Switch, because if I wanted to play those, I don't have a 3DS. So I'd have to track those down, and then I don't know if they're available on the eShop or whatever. Like, I, like it's not convenient to get those games right now, unfortunately, in my opinion. I would really love if there was just like a pack of those available on the eShop on Switch or something. But since there's not, I'll probably just be jumping straight into Bravely Default 2 blind. I don't think there's to really... Be clear, like... To be clear, it's like a new... It's like Final Fantasy where it doesn't actually... There's no story tie over, but, you know... Right, but still, spiritual. sometimes I want... Successor, yeah, not, not even spiritual, just a successor. See how it changes things up or whatnot. Mechanically. Yeah, that's kind of yeah, kind of what I wanted to see was just like... Well, the, you know, the growth from game to game in terms of how it's set up and all that. Other than that, that covers us for the first February edition of the Tetracast. So thanks for listening. Uh, you might have saw that we did manage to put our first episode in a long while up on YouTube and that last week, and that seems to have gone pretty well. So we will do that again this week. As always, our cast will also be able to be found on Google Podcasts, on Spotify, and then also directly from the website. And then I think, other than that, I guess I should give out the normal shout out to that you can always visit us at our website at rpgsite.net. You can follow us on Twitter at rpgsite or on Facebook at rpgsitenet. And then we're, we're still thinking up some ideas of how to use our YouTube channel at rpgsitenet. Hopefully we'll put up another casual mode video soon uh, in addition to our Tetracast uploads. But a lot of that is still a work in progress. If you made it to the end, uh, we're sorry for uh, starting out with Werewolf. We we apologize. Uh, hopefully, the uh, final, yeah. Hopefully, the Final Fantasy and Mass Effect discussion made up for it. Uh, please leave us a comment whether you liked or disliked any section of this. Uh, we we do read those, and we will be back next week with another edition of the TetraCast. So, thanks for listening. Take care. <laughs>